Okay. I would like to welcome everybody to the June 22nd regular scheduled city council meeting. Thank you for showing up early. We realize it's a little bit different um, than what we've been doing uh, this year, but uh, there's a lot on the agenda. So we want to make sure we can get it all in and everybody uh, can be heard. That being said, um, closer to about six o'clock, we will take um, a little recess, depending on how the agenda's at. I'm not sure what item we'll actually be at, but we'll just kind of see how that goes so everybody can stretch their legs and get a little break. May we have a roll call? Councilmember Brooks? Here. Councilmember Clark? Here. Councilmember Peterson? Here. Vice Mayor Brown? Here. And Mayor Kaiser? Here. Would you all join in the ple Pledge of Allegiance? Any additions or deletions to the agenda? Thank you, Madam Mayor. We do have one proposed change to the agenda this evening. At the request of the applicant, uh, staff is proposing to move item 7A, which is the Capitola Bar and Grill Entertainment Permit Appeal, uh, from the first item to the last item on the agenda. Great, thank you. And any additional materials? <laughs> Staff received additional materials for items 7A and 7B. All additional materials were incorporated into the agenda packet, both online and in hard copy, and were provided to the City Council. For item 7A, staff received 12 emails, um, which were provided to the public and City Council. In addition, there were also 20 additional materials for the previously scheduled appeal, which were included with this agenda packet. For item 7B, there were three additional materials received. Great, thank you. We'll move on to oral communications. Um, this is for members of the public. Uh, if you wish to speak on any of the consent items or any other items that are not listed in our agenda this evening, you will have three minutes to speak and our clerk will be helping us keep our time. Good evening. Um, I live on, on McCormick Avenue. Um, I just came up to speak about the slide on, on uh, Monterey Avenue. I guess there's been some um, problems with the property owner and whose problem it is that the, the slide is in place. Um, city says it's the owners, the owner says it's the city's. But the big issue is three quarters of the bike lane is, is covered. And if a kid gets out there or somebody gets injured, somebody's going to sue somebody, and I know it will include the city. Why doesn't Public Works go up there and take one of our tractors, clean it up, and make a record of it, and put a tax lien on the property? but at least do something to clean it up so the bike lane is open. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public wish to speak? Hi, my name is Goran Klapic. I walked today uh, by McDonald's on 41st Avenue and uh, there was a sofa, a piece of furniture uh, put out on a parking lot uh, in the back of uh, Capitola Diner. And I've been seeing this piece of furniture since two or three days. And I've been uh, calling in to public works to remove it because it's not safe. Somebody can drive into it or somebody can stumble upon it or injure himself or herself. Thank you very much for listening. Have a nice day. Goodbye. Thank you. Uh, 
Hi, my name is Tom Mater, and I'm a 35-year resident of Capitola. And I'd like to say a few words of appreciation to a former resident of Capitola who passed away earlier this month. Does the name Tony Coltieri ring a bell with any of you? If you raise your hand. We all raising your hand. Tony passed away. Uh, he was retired here, uh, oh gosh, uh, 1991 and uh, moved near our home on Depot Hill. And the late 1980s and early 90s featured a wide variety of uh, quasi-ethical uh, activities on the part of certain city council members and uh, staff department heads. Tony, like my wife, and I were troubled by these unseemly abuses of public trust, and he campaigned for council aided by my wife who carried our then baby daughter around in a backpack going door to door. He won and served two terms, uh, including a stint as mayor. Early in this first term, the council colleagues and certain city staff became enamored with a development proposal for a monster box store on Bay Avenue between Woodworm and, Free and the freeway. I formed and financed a community group called Save the Habitat to oppose this ill-conceived project on a large swath of riparian habitat adjacent to Soquel Creek. We expressed our opposition at several uh, commission and city council meetings, but at the penultimate council meeting, where more than 70 people spoke in opposition to the development, we lost, with Tony being the only sole dissenting council member. We then sued the city and developer and initially won our case in local court. The developer appealed with the, 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 uh, and the city to Superior Court in San Jose. As the months dragged on, Tony convinced his civil council colleagues to drop their support. And in the end, we won, and the judges ordered the developer to pay our legal costs plus 6% to recognize the public service of our nature of our lawsuit. The total financial uh, remuneration to uh, save the habitat was over $100,000. And we threw a pretty super party with Tony. Now, the point here is that Tony ushered in a new era of higher integrity on the council and with the city staff, including term limits for council members and serving as an inspiration for council and staff. Number two, the majority of land adjacent to Soquel Creek on both sides from Perry Park to the freeway is now preserved as a conservation easement forever. No development. So thank you for your time and to Tony, Thank you for your wisdom, leadership, so sorry. and most gentle and inspiring demeanor. Aloha. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, City of Capitol, thank you for having me. I've been here since a resident since 1969. I own the property right next door to the Shadowbrook Restaurant, 1800 Wharf Road. Uh, the Shadowbrook has a 500-gallon propane tank that's neatly hidden away behind their maintenance area. You cannot see it uh, from any of their walkways or from the road. Uh, just yesterday, Robin Woodman, the uh, building official, went by and she uh, discovered this and was quite shocked. I'm trying to make it a point to the city at this point. I don't want to sue my neighbor. I have photos showing that the tank is actually encroaching on my property line and is seven feet from my home structure. This is illegal in four separate ways that I've written down. Uh, I like to see the city implement a rule, regulation, adopt some sort of regulation that propane tanks, very large ones, like a 500 gallon propane tank cannot be placed uh, seven feet from any structure, from any home. It's illegal through the state of California but the city itself does not have any rules or regulations regarding this. So I would love to see some action taken. I've talked to OSHA, Cal OSHA, um, NFPA, the fire station down here, the fire marshal of the county, they all pass the buck. They say, see this person, they see this person. I'm just getting passed around. So uh, Ms. Mayor and city council, please uh, give me uh, contact my phone number is 831-462-5896. I'm at 1800 Wharf Road, flat top, White House, 
and this uh, propane take is quite shocking. You have to be on my property to see it and to uh, notice how dangerous. And we are very threatened by the Shadowbrook tank. They will not take action, and uh, nobody's taking action. And I want to do anything I can before I launch a lawsuit. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public in-house wish to speak? Don't think I see any. Are, is there anybody online? We do have one speaker with their hand raised on Zoom, Mayor. Um, I will allow John to speak. John, you'll have three minutes once you unmute yourself. Hey guys, uh, bear with me tonight. I'm exhausted. I've been working GMT time. Uh, one, it sounds like uh, Tony was a great guy and I definitely hope we have more counselors like him in the future. Uh, I'd like to talk about the trail today, uh, or the interim trail. Uh, so it looks like from the planning, I've delved deeply into this. I've read all the RTC plans and the related uh, materials. Uh, it looks like they're going to take the easements behind Escalona Drive in order to build that retaining wall. Whatever, you know, I mean, that's public land. I, I get it. Uh, my concern is where the interim trail runs through the village. So when you get to the end of park there, uh, where park meets Monterey, the trail will then just be that little one foot sliver, not even, of like drainage ditch next to the sidewalk going down Monterey Ave into the village. Uh, if a big truck comes by, you can't even fit a bike there. The sidewalk is so narrow there, you can't even fit two strollers by one another. So there's really no way to take away sidewalk. Uh, and that's, of course, our only sidewalk down Monterey that is available for rollers as the elevated sidewalk on the other side of the street doesn't really work for strollers and stuff. Then when you get into the village, uh, as far as I can tell, the trail is literally the Capitola Ave sidewalk in the village. Uh, I've talked to the RTC. They won't say what exactly it is, but they say existing, tra or existing bike paths through Capitola. There is no bike path uh, headed, I guess that's east on Capitola Ave. There's only the sidewalk, and we have two curb bulb outs that will make it impossible to add a, a bike lane there, even if we removed all the parking, which I doubt the Coastal Commission would let us do anyway. Uh, so, yeah, I, uh, I haven't heard any of you guys address these issues. Uh, I've heard people who are yes on D and people who are no on D bring them up in meetings. At some point, are we gonna talk about how an interim trail that uses the side of Monterey there and the sidewalks through the village is like not workable or even in the realm of possibility? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Any other online speakers? We don't have any other people with their hand raised at, their, at this time. Okay. We will Close public comment. We will move on to uh, staff and city council comments. Staff, do we have any comments? No comments this evening. Great. Council? Um, I just had a brief one. Um, today I was super fortunate to be a part of our uh, torch run. So I just wanted to say thank you to the PD for putting that on. It was a really fun event and really felt uh, like we bridged gaps between our staff and our PD and all other types of people. So it was something that I hope to be a part of again. So thank you so much. And that's probably what all the noise was that you heard earlier today. <laughs> all right, so then we'll come down to item six, which is consent. Um, these consent items will be enacted in one motion in the form listed below. So no separate discussion on these. Um, we can go ahead with a motion unless anybody needs to pull anything. I'll move to approve the consent items. A second. Great, we have a first and a second. Maybe we have a roll call, please. Councilmember Brooks. Councilmember Clark. Aye. Councilmember Peterson. Aye. Council or Vice Mayor Brown. Aye. And Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, we'll take it to general government. Um, so we are going to start right off the bat with 7B. Uh, 7A has been moved to the end. And we have Ms. Khan here. 
Bear with me one minute as I prepare the presentation. This is the Grand Avenue Pathway item, FYI. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council members. Uh, this item is to discuss the Grand Avenue pathway. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so a little bit of background on the Grand Avenue pathway. This is an image from 1974 when Grab Avenue was still a two-way street along up there on Depot Hill. Um, it's been closed since the 1980s. It originally went between Central and Sacramento Avenue. Um, it's currently a pedestrian walkway that only extends two blocks east of Central Avenue to Oakland Avenue. Next slide, please. Um, so a little bit of history and previous council direction on this item starting in 2005. Uh, the council um, discussed this item at length and came up with the direction for staff to maintain a minimum pathway of eight feet and to continue to relocate the pathway within the city's right away until it was no longer usable. So as it keeps eroding away, keep moving the pathway inland until we are at the point where we there is no right of way left. Uh, in 2017, in response to a failure between Oak Oakland and Hollister Avenues, uh, we ended up closing that area. There was quite a bit of erosion in that area. Um, also during that discussion, there was a formation of an ad hoc Depot Hill Bluff group to explore the uh, alternatives for maintaining the pathway across the whole pathway. Um, and it took about a year for them to come back with options to council. They uh, presented several options, um, including uh, filling the undercut areas of the bluff and construction of a groin or seawall to preserve the pathway. At that time, no action was taken by council and the closure between Oakland and Hollister, that area is still closed. Next slide, please. Um, so most recently in January 2003, we had bluff failure between Saxon and Oakland, which is the area we're speaking about this evening. Um, looking closely at this image, you can see some of the chain link fencing that Public Works has brought up to keep people away from the bluff. There on the bottom right is the debris that most recently fell, taking part of the uh, fencing down with it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so here is the entirety of the pathway. As you can see, the area from Central to Saxon is still open and functional. The uh, damaged part that's about halfway blocked off with cyclone fencing is there between Saxon and Oakland, and then the uh, remainder of the pathway between Oakland and Hollister remains closed. Next slide. Um, it's worth noting that um, all three of these sections have some encroachments into the city right-of-way. Uh, when it was a road in the 70s, the city did not take the whole right-of-way to build the road. So the existing pathway is the remaining old roadway. Um, there's between four to 14 feet of city right-of-way. Um, on each of these properties that most of them have filled in with some kind of fencing and or landscaping. So the part between Saxon and Oakland there is circled in yellow, but there's also the same condition between Central and Saxon, and also some of that same condition between Oakland and Hollister. However, those are much less in the right of way because the right of way has continued to erode into the ocean. Uh, next slide, please. And this is a close up just in case you couldn't really see it. Uh, you can see where the parcel lines are there in black and then where some of that landscaping extends into the right of way. Um, so in response to this most recent failure, the city contracted with Eric Zinn of Pacific Crest Engineering. He is the same geologist who completed the previous studies in 2017. So he had a real frame of reference of the current damage and also comparing it to the damage from approximately five years ago. Uh, both those of those uh, geologist letters were included in the agenda packet for this evening. Uh, the primary findings of this most recent letter states that the bluff is in various states of failure between Saxon and Oakland Avenues, um, some of it precariously so at this time. Uh, the bluff between Oakland and Hollister has continued to retreat, as I said earlier this evening, and then estimates also the retreat in the next one to six years to be 11 to 19 feet. Um, and Mr. Zen is in the audience this evening. If you have any uh, 
specific questions for him regarding these reports. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a image that was also included in this report. You can see the black line is the current top of bluff, um, and the green line is the projected top of bluff uh, one to six years from now. It definitely varies. It doesn't quite get to the end of the right of way in the portion that we are talking about tonight between Saxon and Oakland, but gets far into the property lines on the next block up from Oakland to Hollister. Next slide, please. Um, so the staff recommendation in the staff report uh, to mitigate some of the safety issues here is to move our fencing inland. So by doing that, we still have an eight to 10 foot pathway, which meets the uh, recommendation from council or direction from council in 2005 to maintain an eight foot pathway in the right of way. Um, we estimate per the geologist report that this would extend the useful life of the pathway one to six years. Um, we would not recommend removing private encroachments, but it does not rule out us removing these prior encro private encroachments at a later date if and when or if the uh, bluff continues to erode. Next slide, please. Other options would be to pursue removing the encroachments. Um, the way public works staff would propose to do this is to move the fencing inland immediately to reopen the pathway and then work with each of the property owners to uh, abate the encroachments, which would frankly take significant staff time and probably considering the workload of public works right now, about a year's time to fully abate all of those encroachments. It would result into a 12 to 14 foot pathway and would extend the life likely beyond the one to six years estimated for the uh, staff recommendation alternative one. Uh, the other alternative action to, would be to close the pathway on Saxon Avenue, which would relieve the city, obviously, of maintenance of this walkway and liability because we would abandon the right of way. This would require a coastal development permit, which would be appealable by the public or the Coastal Commission. Uh, the Coastal Commission had provided a letter about five years ago uh, suggesting or recommending that the city reclaim all of the area and the right of way to maintain this trail. Next slide, please. Um, so the fiscal impact, as you can imagine, greatly varies with these three options. So these are just relative fiscal impacts to these options. Um, moving the fence would be a low staff time, low capital cost, and a moderate one to six year risk uh, for the city of the bluff eroding the part of the fence that we had moved. Um, removing encroachments would be a moderate capital cost for the fencing and then restoring it to be a pathway where we had, the landscaping would be removed. Um, it would be high staff time to mitigate all of these encroachments, um, but would reduce the risk of losing the pathway. And then pathway closure would be a low capital cost because we would no longer be maintaining it. Moderate staff time to pursue the permit to do so. And then the risk would be low to users because there would be no users of the pathway if we were to close it. Next slide, please. So that is the staff recommendation. Uh, there is a picture of what it currently looks like up there. This meeting was posted both on the pathway and postcards sent to about 350 properties in the vicinity of the walkway of this evening's meeting. And I or Mr. Zinn are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Any uh, questions from council? Um, I just have two uh, questions in regard to kind of the pathway overall. Um, we had received, and stop me if this isn't appropriate on topics. I know we're talking about this specific section, what to do about it, but we had received a resident email about an engineering drainage study um, that was undertaken in the past. And I'm just wondering if you can speak to considerations that would help further erosion. So I know that this was storm related, but looking at an overall big picture, has there been any consideration of the drainage, drainage issues that would help prevent further erosion at this area of the bluff? So you're correct. The erosion that we're mostly speaking of here is storm related, though drainage from the neighboring properties and streets definitely helps exacerbate that erosion. Um, there was a drainage study completed in 2008. The estimate for doing that project in 2008 was $800,000. So that's a longer term consideration. Definitely not tonight. Okay. Um, and then I, I understand that there's kind of complexities related to what the Coastal Commission would allow us to do in terms, especially I know you mentioned like a coastal development permit if we were to close the path down altogether, which um, I don't think is a great idea. 
Um, but I'm curious, if, have we looked into any funding options because this was storm damage related from FEMA or any other grants in terms of kind of preventing any further problems from future storms or repairing the damage that is caused by this storm aside from just what we're looking at in these three options? Have we looked into any kind of FEMA or any other kind of funding for this pathway? So FEMA will pay to move the fencing. Um, they will not pay to armor the bluff side. Um, similarly, there are coastal conservancy grants that would likely help enhance the walkway um, in its place, but not likely to armor the bluff. So, so we could look into some funding to help for this particular aspect of relocating fencing and whatnot, but not anything in the bigger picture of preventing further storm damage. It would be unlikely to be funded. Okay, cool. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, we can um, go out to public comment for this. So anybody in the audience that wish to comment, we will keep it at the uh, three minute mark. If you do decide to speak, come on up. Uh, Skip Allen, uh, 310 um, McCormick Avenue. I've uh, uh, been walking the pathway for uh, 48 uh, years, and I've watched the advancement of the cliff falling off. Um, we won't stop that ever. That is just how it works. However, the pathway is a valuable public place. People uh, just love to go there. The current f f f uh, fencing there is obscene. It's seven f f feet high and it's a uh, chain link and kids are uh, I'm going to climb around either end of it. That has to go, please. Also, I'm wondering what will happen if the new fence is located eight, eight uh, feet from the um, landscaping, and then there's another fall in, and the path is narrowed or becomes impassable. When will the encroachments be be removed? Uh, we've already lost Hollister to Oakland because the encroachments uh, weren't removed. They were more permanent in structure, and it was expensive. But I would ask that the council take seriously at the encroachments, when can they be removed? Because they are in the pathway now, and when the pathway fails, their encroachments uh, will block the pathway. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members in house wish to speak? Hello, my name is Stan Kettner. I live in the neighborhood, and I've been walking my dogs in the neighborhood for quite some time, um, probably 30 years or so. Um, it disturbed me when you guys closed Hollister and Oakland because you did not remove the encroachments. And that has been closed for, what, five or six years? Is that correct? And there's been no erosion whatsoever. Um, in that area since. And the encroachments are considerable. They're anywhere from six to eight feet. Some, some of the encroachments are 10 feet. I applied for a revocable easement when I put in landscaping. And it states in the easement or the revocation that I, as the property owner, have to remove any landscaping that's there. So staff does not have to do that. The property owner is responsible. You may want to look into that. Um, also, does the Coastal Commission, are they aware that you're trying to remove our access and that you did in that area? 
I don't think anybody's addressed that. Um, and it's concerning to all of us that live up there. And the encroachments are, in, are pretty insane, quite a bit. And I would really be bummed if we lost that, that pathway. And none of the issues for, for storm drains or drainage has been addressed at all. And part of a big part of the problem between Hollister and Oakland was drainage off of one of the properties is what caused that big collapse. So um, also in front of the Parker South, um, where it collapsed considerably this year and the fence is gone, that's where you, the city has put a drain at and it's taken all of that cliff away. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Tom Mater, and my daughter is passing out some things uh, for the mayor, uh, the councilman. Um, I'm here to uh, partially approve of option one, which is um, essentially to only move 45 feet of the fence rather than the whole thing. If you look a little, if you look back to the picture, there's just an area, maybe 45 feet wide, where there's been, uh, the cliff has given way. And I'm proposing that the, w the wooden fence be brought back, as is proposed now, to where it is, except two more 15-foot uh, sections go up from either side, so that just one spot. And the thing that struck me is if, if you try and observe the view looking over on the back here of the statement you can't see a significant amount of wildlife much less you can't see any surfing not even bambura on a big day from if you're back there behind that chain link fence so i'm suggesting just some of it gets moved back temporarily uh, i'd also echo stan's um, a comment, the previous speaker, that this chain link fence is an embarrassing eyesore uh, to residents, to visitors alike, and I'd like to see it taken out of there right after the 4th of July, gone. And quickly, the pieces that are left, that would be five 15-foot sections, are still retained at the area. Three of them go across the 45-foot distance, and if you look on the back, those are where the red lines are. So that we would just fence off that temporarily and still allow public viewing in the other area. I don't have much time left. I wanna make uh, a couple other comments. Uh, item number five, uh, we, uh, I and two other uh, homeowners up there have erected a canvas tarpaulin chain link uh, uh, I guess you'd call it diversion or um, we're trying to go across the yellow part of the map and what I'm suggesting is done is we get a we get a proposal to try and save the sand up there on the marine terrace and I'm not proposing the city pay for this only the part on of their own street Saxon and and uh, Hollister and so forth those of us who are homeowners there's um, two that have already done it based on a meeting back when this thing last failed in uh, 2017. They followed what I had done. And it, may I have about another minute? I'm so sorry. We do have other speakers waiting for their turn. Thank you. Thank you. Good, uh, good afternoon, TJ Welch uh, from Depot Hill. Just real quick, actually, I'd like to give a minute to Tom to finish up. But I just want to say a couple things about this. Really disappointed. One, 
We never did follow through with the initial part of the depot hill uh, bluff erosion, and we've left it there in disarray, had homeless there for a while, so on. Goes on with Esplanade Park, same thing down there, one of our nicest parks in the city. The city has never followed through and uh, taken care of keeping that park open. The area that we're talking about now, I would support uh, option one, and I think we should be able to get the, uh, I would hope we'd have to get the state to support us on the coastal bluff uh, to do some armoring there since they want to keep it open. Uh, they were pretty adamant about public access, even on public property up there on Depot Hill. So I support option one, and uh, Stan and Tom would be happy to give a minute of my time left to, to Tom. Thank you. So I'm really sorry, but we do have other speakers and we can't cede time to other residents when doing public comment. Um, so we'll take the next speaker. Anybody else in house wish to speak? Do we have anybody online? We do have members of the public who wish to speak. I'll go ahead and start with Susan Bennett. Susan, you will have three minutes to speak once you unmute yourself. Hello, my name is Susan Gibbs Bennett, and uh, we have property, shared property for over 100 years on Depot Hill. It is um, on Grand and Saxon. We um, definitely would like to see the chain link fence be removed in a timely manner and we would like to know when that can happen but we'd also like to see interpretive signs put up to talk about the plant life the animal life the sea life and any other um, interpretive signs that we can for the public to enjoy the area we'd like to see the wooden fence be re moved back into a nice um position so that everybody could be safe but also could be um enjoy the beauty of the area and i would like to thank all the council member and everyone for this time thank you very much great thank you the next speaker john you'll have three minutes to speak once you unmute yourself Hey guys, uh, I'm a resident of Capitola and I live on Depot Hill. Uh, so I assume we're not gonna take our public land back even though long-term that, that is the solution that will come to pass. Uh, I'm more concerned about how we're gonna use this path uh, when we rebuild it. Uh, the Coastal Commission will never let us close it, so that's a dream. So central to Saxon is only about four to five feet wide. At one point, there's even a hedge there that makes it about three feet wide in actual progress. Uh, and then you get Saxon to Oakland. Right now, if we build the fence where the chain link fence is, you have most of that area is gonna be about eight feet wide. Uh, the two-way multi-use bike pedestrian trail our uh, recommendation from both the federal government and the state of California is 12 foot recommended. You guys might remember this from some of the interim trail hearings uh, and 10 foot minimum. So we don't actually meet the minimum for a multi-use bike pedestrian trail between Saxon and Oakland. Uh, between Central and Saxon, we don't actually meet the minimum for a two-way pedestrian trail. Uh, that's a six foot minimum to have a two-way pedestrian trail. So uh, I would really love you all to consider just closing that trail to bikes when we fix it. Uh, there's a lot of hedges, there's a lot of sharp turns onto streets, and there's a lot of tourists who go very, very fast on their electric bikes. Uh, it's already been a danger with the width of the trails it is. Uh, some of the locals actually call the section between Central and Saxon the gauntlet because you never know what you're gonna get there. Uh, so yeah, I just, uh, I think it would be for safety purposes, we're about to have this incredible interim trail. There's no reason to keep that uh, path open to bikes when we know it doesn't meet any of the federal or state standards for safety as far as width. Thank you. Thank you. That is the last person with their hand raised on Zoom. Okay, great. So I will take it back to council. Um, do you have any follow-up questions or comments? Um, 
Thank you, Jessica. I know this was a lot to, to bring forward and, and fortunate that we have to discuss it today because of our storms. Um, the first question I have is regarding just safety. We all agree that that, that fence is bright and ugly and we all know that. Um, but tell me a little bit about the reason it's so large and if there's any safety requirements or um, reason behind that maintaining the same there for the time being. Sure, so we erected the fence initially against that entire section just because we didn't know what was underneath if the whole area was undercut. We really just had no idea what it looked like. Um, it took us a minute to get a geologist out there and we did the assessment. Um, while I did not go into it in the presentation, there are areas of it that are significantly undercut. There are areas that are notched. There are areas that have other issues that it wouldn't be safe to just only remove the section of fence that fell down. Um, so the recommendation from the geologist is to move that whole section of fence back. Um, city has no intention of leaving just a cyclone fence up there because I completely agree that it is not very aesthetically pleasing. It would be to move that wooden split rail fence um, and then obviously replace the portion of the fence that fell into the ocean in the same manner. And, that, and so we didn't see numbers behind projects. We just saw kind of expensive more expensive than super expensive is what I saw up there. Um, has staff thought about a um, what kind of the longer term plan? So if we move from an option one and then eventually looking into option two and the encroachment, um, and because that takes longer and we know you're very busy, busy with staff time. Um, have you thought about that and what the cost would be for council to move in that direction? Should we move forward with option one and then over some time look at the other option? Sure. I just want to know what the financial burdens are for the city. Sure. So to move the fencing, that is covered by FEMA. So we would have a reimbursable rate, I think, of 6.25% of probably less than $100,000. I would say that's a very high end of moving a fence. Um, as one of the speakers mentioned, the encroachments, the removal of the landscaping and any fencing that they have would be on that resident to remove whatever encroachment they had. However, I would assume that most of what would be left is dirt. And so any kind of pathway, whether it be asphalt, DG, whatever we would replace that with, um, would be on the city to reestablish. And so it would really depend on the type of materials as to how much that would cost. Um, obviously, asphalt probably be the quickest and cheapest, but there is an opportunity here to make it something, something enhanced. Do I recall we prioritize some sort of funding in future like as a council for our priorities or budgets for upcoming projects? Have we done that? So last year in the budget we allocated, I think it was $50,000 for some erosion studies, mm -hmm. which we are actually using on the cliff drive erosion study. Um, I can't think, we've also set aside some funding for future in infrastructure projects. We wanted to see where some bids came in, but I can't think of another pot of money we'll, which we've allocated, which would directly tie into something like this. One point I will make is that option one and two re realistically can be done in sequence. Like they don't, we can proceed with option one now. It doesn't preclude us moving forward with option two. In fact, we could move forward with option two a year from now if we wanted to start in that direction. So I'd say, I think it really is good to think about option one as kind of the first step, get the path open, get the chain link fence out of there. Let's you know re restore access. And if the council wants to then devote more resources and try to get the encroachments off, we can do that whether we started 12 months, 24 months, 36 months. Great. Um. Well, I, for just conversation's sake, I would um, think that option one would be the best to, to begin with, and then looking at bringing this back at some point for option two to talk about how much funds we can, uh, you know, bring forward to it. There were two other comments about federal funding, um, and we we actually went for federal funding for some of the erosion project, and we we actually brought FEMA out here already to analyze that. And then there was a comment about um, from a speaker, Susan, on signage. And I just wanted to comment that I'm working on um, it with Noah. Um, so just that that that's being addressed. Um, those are just my comments for now. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I had comment. I almost think it would be nice to see like a 1.5 if we, like the city manager said, start with one and then work towards number two. I think that would be the best way to go. 
Yeah, uh, I had a question about um, how um, one of the speakers was talking about like a tarp type of system to um, make the bluff last longer. Can you speak on that as an option, or you know, is that something that would be very expensive, or or has been considered to extend the life of the path? So I know that there are definitely private residences up, especially between Oakland Action and where the uh, ro the path is completely closed that has put up that type of erosion control. I will say that the city has not costed that out um, or explored its effectiveness at this time. So the to, short answer to the question is no, we have not. Um, yeah, I would encourage into that a little bit anyways and also um totally agree um with everything the council has said so far but i would um state that i'd prefer if we started looking into, into option two sooner rather than later so it doesn't you know we don't address the encroachment at the path level it's a problem we can start on that sooner yeah i was just gonna say um I agree that option one is probably the way to go now to get things moving. Um, and maybe option two, we could look at it mid-year budget, which is what, March, usually when we do that? Would that be an appropriate time to look at option two during our mid-year budget discussions when we start looking at what the money we still have and all that good stuff? Councilmember Brown, I think you've worked with me for a long time and you predicted exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> yes, that would be, that's the next time we start looking at kind of what fina our financial situation is, where the staff bandwidth is, and what kind of projects the council wants to proceed. So next February is a great opportunity there. So that's like eight months-ish from now, seven months from now. How long is it going to take for us to accomplish option one if we start? So when would we start trying to get option one underway if we were to vote for that tonight? And how long would that take? So FEMA was out here yesterday, actually, looking at the fence. So it is on their books, which is a good thing. Once that it's recorded with FEMA, we're allowed to move forward with it. We would need to bid that project um, and then get a contractor out here. I will say that we just finished bidding multiple other uh, projects that you all approved the funding for um, earlier in this meeting. Um, so those are in line ahead of this project. But I would say a fall would be a time that we could have that fencing move. So, so, okay, so fall, so the bidding process for those who don't, aren't a part of government bidding processes, right? It usually takes, what, a couple weeks for us to even put the bid, to, to ask for people to give us bids, right? And then it needs to be open for 30 days legally. Um, and so we're looking at at least two months until we could even find out what the numbers are that people are bidding to us, correct? correct. So that brings us to at least August-ish, September, so that is that is fall. So that's based on the legal requirements of how we would need to bid this project, correct? Correct, and since it's a federal project, it's very important to meet all of those okay. it, because for us to be reimbursed. Okay, that makes sense. Um, okay, so then if that were to start, you know, September-ish, fall, um, and then we could go into mid-year budget reviews to consider removing the encroachment, but before then, the fence would have already been moved back. So we would have accomplished number one and we would be heading, or option one, and we would be heading into option two. If that's what the council votes tonight. I, I don't know. Talk amongst yourselves. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I had one thing to add on to that. If, if we could also, at, maybe at one point, sooner than later, remove some of the chain link fencing because where the slide is, is a lot smaller portion than the whole length of the chain link fence. So if we could at least limit it to a, a small portion. Just a reminder to members of the public that we're still having council discussion and we ask that you maintain decorum in the audience. Thank you. It would enhance the view until we get the opportunity to rebuild the entire fence if we could just make it a little bit smaller. That's so we can reassess with the geologist about what part is most like most risk. I will say it is more than just the area of the fence that that failed in the bluff that is not stable. So it, it is not just isolated to the part of the fence that is missing. But perhaps it is not the whole stretch of fence where we have the cyclone fencing. 
Yeah, I think that that um, is being voiced that that's, we kind of need to see some motion happening just so that it is not what it looks like right now. I don't think anybody's really happy with that. Um, so I th think I am in agreement of at least getting option one started as soon as possible. Um, I know that there are time constraints, um, but along with uh, the encroachments, I think can we start reaching out to the property owners like ASAP and sort of get that on their radar and make sure that they know that this is probably gonna be coming down towards them because I think it's also just, you know, it's public property. And so I think that could be addressed um, to start that process as well for option two. Um, that's just where I'm thinking is just to get the ball rolling. I was going to offer one suggestion. I think there's one other option we can look at this summer would be trying to get maybe, because I think it's a six foot cyclone fence right now, to see whether or not it's higher. It's, it's, but it's a tall fence. Um, but see whether or not there's some sort of temporary fencing option we could do before building the new fence. And just, just I get it, that look is really, it's pretty austere. So if we could get like a lower end fence over a smaller portion, I think that might help help the concern about not moving forward with the reconstruction of the fence until fall. So that's another thing we can look into. We have to balance that obviously with the risk, but at the end of the day, you know, the, the, the long-term fence isn't eight feet tall either, so. And just because somebody brought it up, um, bikes are technically allowed on that path or? Yes, okay. I don't know offhand. The, I don't believe there's any restrictions to use on that path. Um, I just have never seen anybody who was interested in that. Um, okay, so thank you for that. Do we have um, further? I just have a quick question. Do you need us to approve funding for additional fencing or anything like that in our motion this evening so that you don't need to come back to us and say, Council, do you want Talking to about temporary fencing over the summer? Yeah. I think we can cover that internally with just existing budget. Okay. Um, I just want to make sure we have. Do you want me to take a stab at this one? Yeah. Okay. Let me just pull it up then. And Ms. Khan, do you need us to be any more specific on outreach regarding the encroachment um, notifications to uh, owners, property owners, as we move into the next phase? Or can we just assume that that's going to be part of this? The city has a process for uh, addressing encroachments in the right of way that we would follow. Okay, just based off of the motion this evening, I think being more proactive and doing it earlier, I would, if council would agree, if we can get it out earlier than our normal notifications, just because we have so many folks here today that it would matter, I appreciate that. Okay, do we have this? Okay. Um, so I'd like to go ahead and make a motion to move forward with option, staff recommendation option one, which is to relocate and repair the existing, existing fencing um, additionally, bringing back in the, our mid-year budget option two, um, regard, our staff recommendation to option two for analysis and possible approval of um, that at our budget hearing. Does that sound, is that enough? Okay. Um, I'll second that. And I just had um, one question um, for clarification. The section between Oakland and Hollister, is there any possibility of reopening that if the encroachments were claimed? Or is that just it's too degraded at this point? That has eroded more significantly where part, part of there, there is no right of way left. Got it, thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Clark. Aye. Councilmember Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Brown. Aye. And Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Thank you. That passes unanimously. Mm 
I'll let the crowd dissipate for a moment. Okay, so we will head on to item 7C. This will be presented by Chloe. This is the memorials, plaque memorials installed on Capitol Wharf. Yes, thank you, Mayor. If you don't mind, can I wait just a second? Go for it. Yes, I just wanted to start it up. Let it tie down. Okay, and thank you um, for our city clerk running through the presentation. Thank you, Mayor Kaiser and Council. We'll be speaking about the memorial plaques that are currently on Capitola Wharf. And you may recall this issue was brought to your attention earlier this year, um, kind of in conjunction with the storm damage. So a few reminders. Memorials have been installed on the wharf for decades. Um, currently and before the storm in January, 145 plaques are along the railing, and 39 are installed on various benches that are on the wharf. So after the storm, staff estimates it could be higher, but at least 20 of the plaques have been lost. And um, we're very excited that our wharf resiliency project is starting off this coming fall. So thank you to our public works director for making that happen. Uh, moving on, a little more background. As you remember, at our meeting on April 27th, we um, discussed three options for the plaques in light of this wharf project. The first being um, removing the plaques from the railing and different benches and placing them on some sort of artistic structure that would still be located on the wharf. Secondly, uh, reinstalling all plaques in the same location. Uh, staff does have records um, indicating where everything is, um, photo, photos exist, so we could do that. And thirdly, removing the plaques and sending them or holding on to them for their owners, which um, we did discuss that with you in April, and council requested that we survey the community, but most um, particularly plaque owners, to hear what they wanted and to come back to you for more information. So that's why I'm here this evening. Uh, I do wanna just say again, we, we talked about this in April, but the plaques are very special to their, the people that have purchased them in the past, and I do understand that. And it is emotional for a lot of people, this topic. So I appreciate those in the audience as well. So we did a survey. It was an um, online survey. It was open from May 5th to yesterday. It was promoted in our e-newsletter. Uh, three or four issues was posted on social media. The link was on our website, and um, an email went out to everyone we had um, heard from that were asking, what are you going to do about the, the plaques, and that we had email accurate information for. Um, so it was sent directly to those uh, with a link to that survey. Uh, we got about 70 responses, and 65% of them are people that do, in fact, have a plaque. So we were able to use the survey not only to hear um, opinions, but collect information from those if they owned a plaque to tell us, you know, what is the name and do we have your information? How do we reach out to you, et cetera? So survey results. Uh, the most important question for this uh, hearing is we asked the, the um, responders, how satisfied would you be with one of those three options we've discussed? So they're in order um, from left to right. So how satisfied would you be with an artistic memorial element? with reinstalling the plaques as they, as they are currently or with returning them. Now the red is dissatisfied, which means no, <laughs> I don't like it. So you can see for yourselves, but um, generally people were more in favor of reinstalling the plaques as they are now. I will say there was a slight difference in those responders who don't have a plaque, who don't own one, were much less concerned um, either way, frankly, and um, we're more open to having a memorial element. So just keep that in mind, but you can see the results. Thank you. So 
tossing out the idea of returning plaques um, through the mail, these are our two options that we're discussing. Um, so for an artistic element, that would be included in our Capitola Wharf Enhancement Project, which you're aware of. Um, a community group is helping the city with that project to beautify the wharf once it is structurally sound and reopened. So this would just go into that kind of scope of work. Estimating costs of everything would be around $30,000. More details to that would come if it is something that you want us to pursue. And council would have approval over what that element is, as you will for all the elements um, you know, in the Capitola Wharf Enhancement Project. So second option to reinstall all the plaques along the railing and on benches, as they are now, that would be included in our Capitola Wharf Resiliency and Public Access Project. Uh, that was included in the, the bids, uh, or, or what we asked people to bid for that project. And the estimation there is about 22,000. That includes the installation costs as part of the project and also purchasing replacement plaques, which would, would happen under both plans. We would replace the plaques that have been lost. Again, we have records of what those were and what the uh, names were and then those would be incorporated. So with that in mind, there are of course future costs and the time to think about for staff to maintain the plaques. We talked about this a little bit more in April, but just rem remember the wharf is wood and the plaques are bronze and it's not a match made in heaven per se. <laughs> so that's just something to consider. And uh, we do recommend if, if under option two to reinstall, think about a time frame, perhaps, to um, establish over the plaques once once they're put back. How long do you want staff to be guaranteed um, ma maintaining those plaques? Because this is would be a slight precedent to just next, you know, if and when there were more damage to the wharf, that we would just kind of do this over and over again. If that makes sense. So that all being said, uh, I'm here for questions. The recommendation I think is just please tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Tell staff what which option are you most interested in, and I can answer any questions. Thank you so much. Thanks, Chloe. Any questions? Um, can we submit to um, FEMA or insurance the twenty-two thousand, Jamie, for since it had to do with storm damage and staff time? Maybe get. Well, I think the technical answer is conceivably we could. However, the issue is that this is a little bit wonky. We ended up not taking any FEMA assistance for the wharf because we were just using our insurance coverage. So, because we had these two different types of assistance we would get, both our property insurance and the FEMA money, having both sources of funding at one project, we were afraid was going to kind of mess it up. So that had been our goal, was just to take the insurance money on the wharf. I don't know. Um, so we could certainly look, if this was an added in component in the wharf, whether or not it's still covered. I think, I, I think probably actually we actually have it paid for as part of our wharf restoration. Basically the story is we have a million dollar policy for wave wash damages. And the insurance company is giving us a million dollars. They've looked at everything that's happened to us and said, here's your million dollars. And so we can look and see if there's the opportunity to try to get FEMA funding. Um, it, it may be more complicated at this stage than, than it's really worth. Yeah, ideally, it'd be great to figure out a way to tie in these damages and staff time since this is going to be above and beyond, um, you know, all, everything else, your, your, your normal jobs and this is, you know, once in a, hopefully all of our lifetime storm damage situation. So um, I'd like for us to look into that. That's just my question for now. I'll save my comments for later. In terms of the maintenance agreement, do we have, is there anything else in the city that we have any kind of timelines on maintenance on in terms of things like this? So we're talking about the plaques, but there's also the painted tiles on the seawall. I don't know if we know about like the chamber and the bricks that are in the walkway. 
Do you know if there's any kind of agreements with those that we could use as examples as we consider for what the future maintenance agreements might be on our new plaque situation? That's a really good question. Yeah, that's that's a great point. I can look into that. I, off the top of my head, I don't know um, about the the tile, the painted tiles. The um, the one situation where I know we do have a naming agreement is in the Capitol Library, mm -hmm. and with that, we actually entered into agreements with the Capitol Branch Library and with some of the major donors about exactly how long their donation was going to be up on the wall at the Capitol Library, and I think it was. 25 or 30 years is my recollection. Because that was just the major donors, right? Not like... What about my brick? Yeah, I was going to say, what about my brick? <laughs> yeah, the bricks, no. No. The bricks, there was, there was, there's no specific agreement. I'm almost 100% sure that in the, uh, the, the tiles on the Esplanade that there's no specific understanding about how long they were going to be up. So I don't think there's anything other than those naming agreements for the major donors in the library. Uh, and then in addition, the room donors, we have a separate agreement between the city and the library system that says they get to stay there. <clears throat> I think it's ten years or the life of the uh, the life of the room, whichever shorter. Yeah, I'm thinking for the library, it's less likely that the room's just going to like fall down. I was thinking more things that are like you know elements sensitive to the elements that we might have agreements to um, or agreements for, like the bricks. Um, okay, yeah, that was my only question. The only point I would make is in the library <clears throat> they do. Um, they libraries are big public buildings and they get reconfigured and remodeled and rooms yeah. moved around and so it, it does become an issue relatively sooner than you think not because of weathering but because of simply like the, the building needs to be updated um, yeah. sooner than you might think uh, question. Um, I think I had a question I guess I think my question was what is the idea moving forward for having sort of this, not expiration date, but like some type of cap. I didn't know if we'd looked into specific options for that yet, or is that something maybe we will think about right now? So my understanding would be from your direction, if you had kind of timing in mind, we would take that and then look, and we can certainly look for examples as um, Vice Mayor Brown recommended as well. Okay. And then when reinstalling, uh, I know that there was, it, this program, we're not reopening this to anything. Okay, so we're just talking about what was lost in the storm. Okay. Currently, the location is full. Yes. So that would still be the case. Okay. And that's just because of whatever parameters were put on the program back when? Yes, I, because it was such a popular mm -hmm. spot. I, it, the locations that were available along the railing and the amount of benches, they're they're you they're used basically without sounding insensitive. <laughs> okay. Um, right now, okay. So we'll go out to public comment. Um, I'm sure there's quite a few people that like to speak, so we will stick to our three minutes here. Um, so if anybody here would like to come up. Gary. Hi, my name is Caroline Hoagland, and I've lived in Capitola since 1995. My husband and I had a bench with two plaques, one that represented his family and one that represented my family. My bench is gone. I know that because I hired a drone to go out and take pictures of all the existing benches. For me, my mother's buried in Michigan, my father's buried in Napa, and my sister's buried in Colma. I can visit all three in one spot at one time. My husband's parents um, are both buried in Ohio. Their children's names, my husband, my, his sister, and two brothers were named on that plaque, your loving children. On that plaque, three of those people have already been passed away, one of which was my husband's. That bench with his name on it and that plaque would mean the world to me to go sit there. Um, and I know 
The plaques and benches mean the world to everyone who put one there. I'm also here because my friend, who I've known since I was 12 years old, also established a bench. Hers is still there. It had three plaques on it, one of which was her son who passed away at 19. Um, she spent, I have pictures, she spent his 30th birthday at that bench. And I don't know how many places a mother who's lost a child could go and smile. The pictures I have of her at that bench where her son's plaque is, she's smiling. So it is a very emotional thing. Um, the only other thing I'd like to say is that um, the benches sit in front of plaques that are on railings. So I benefit from my bench and someone else benefits from my bench. They can sit and look at their plaque on the railing. Um, there's the Santa Cruz Wharf and what was the here in Aptos. This isn't the wharf at Capitola. This is Capitola's wharf. The people who put their benches there is because they love someone and because they love the Capitola enough for that to be the place they wanted their loved ones remembered. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers here? Hi, my name is Linda Davis. Um, I live in Capitola and my grandmother's plaque was on part of the wharf that was lost. Um, she lived here in Capitola with my mom and myself and I can't tell you how many times we went out there. Um, her birthday and mine are three days apart, um, their wedding anniversary, and we would sit on a bench and we would look at my grandmother's plaque and she loved the ocean so much and it was the perfect place to honor her and what she gave us. So I very much vote for option two to replace the plaques on the wharf. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in house would like to come up? I'm not seeing any here. Can we go online? We do have three speakers with their hands raised. The first will be Lisa Murphy. Lisa, you'll have three minutes once you unmute yourself. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council. My name is Lisa Murphy. I'm the former Administrative Services Director for the City of Capitola. And I'm also the, form, the author of this program in its original form. I spent many years administering this program and I understand the former speaker's um, heartfelt desire to return the plaques to the wharf. I spent many years with these folks, helping them to craft the language that they wanted to see so they could remember their loved one. I also have a plaque on the wharf for my father. Jim Maxwell, who was a, a pillar of the community and a former assistant superintendent for, the, for Santa Cruz. I'm calling in today to support the recommendation for a single memorial design element on the wharf, one that could incorporate, I would hope, uh, the plaques that are still there, as well as maybe redesign for the, the ones that may have been lost. I think a single element makes much more sense as opposed to having the individual plaques on the railing. I also think you might want to consider allowing the public to be included in the process of the design of the element. It's interesting to find how creative this community can be uh, when they come together for something so meaningful to them and to the folks of Capitola. I also, with regards to funding, I would ask that you might consider utilizing the public art funds to pay for this project. Uh, this, this may very well qualify. Uh, in closing, I wanna thank you for your time and for your, your consideration of actually putting the plaques in some way, shape or form back up on the, the wharf. My sincere thanks for that. And again, I would like to reiterate my support for a single memorial design uh, that it would be inclusive of the plaques. Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you. 
The next speaker is Dean Sutton. Dean, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. My name is Dean Sutton. I owned a home in Capitola since 83, and I have a, uh, I had a plaque for my father in loving memory of GD Mike Sutton. And we had dad's bench that we used for many years. And I would strongly, strongly request and, and hope that you would replace the plaques. Uh, if, you know, if there needs to be a small fee or something to replace it, uh, we can talk about that. I'd be willing to cooperate. If you can't afford it, if you need to pass the hat or something, that'd be all right. But it sure is important. Uh, you know, my family, my my mother, after my dad died, we would we go sit on dad's bench for a long time and and read the paper and look at, you know, look at the sea. It'd be very nice, please, to replace the plaques. Thank you. The next speaker is Patty. Patty, you will have three minutes to speak. Um, thank you. And uh, really appreciate all your time and sensitivity to us family members. My husband here is, is here with me. Um, we have a plaque for our daughter and granddaughter. Our daughter died in childbirth, and it's a very sentimental plaque for us. My husband's family also co-owns one of the Venetian court units. It's been in the family many years, and it's a very special place for us uh, because the plaque on the wall overlooks where the family-owned um, unit is. So a um, couple of things we would love, you know, to support, you know, putting the plaques back on the wall. Um, it's a very special place for our family to go. We also suspect, but are not sure, that our daughter and granddaughter's plaque was one of the ones that was lost in the storm. It was approximately in the section that appears to be gone. And we're just wondering if there is yet an inventory list, do we know, does the council know which plaques were um, lost in the storm? It, those are my questions. So again, thank you all for your support and sensitivity. We'd love to see the plaques reinstalled and we we're just wondering, and I'll go ahead and you can remute me after this. I was just curious um, if it's known which plaques were lost. Thank you. We can review questions at the end of comments. The next speaker is Steph Christman. Steph, you will have three minutes to speak. Hi there. Um, I think it's really clear based on everybody's commentary that the plaques need to be returned to their original places. These are super sentimental to family members and an amazing place to go to remember those of ours who have passed. Um, but I did see um, a bullet point under that that option that they would expire. And I think um, if you guys are considering an expiration date on these plaques, um, there should be some considerations put into place for that. Um, if this is a, the decision that you take, um, the city of San Francisco reaches out to the contact that is connected to the plaque um, a couple years before expiration date, even though I think it's pretty cold blooded to put an expiration date on people's grieving. Um, but if there is some kind of an expiration put on these plaques, I think there should be some considerations put into place before um, that being an option. Thank you. There are no other speakers with their hands raised. Actually, just kidding. There are. <laughs> Sorry. Valerie Levitt, I noticed you just lowered your hand. If you would like to speak, you can go ahead and raise it again. Nope. Okay. Well, in that case, there are no other speakers. Just, nope. Never mind. Valerie, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm clearly not very good with technology. Um, I, I wanted to um, thank you, city council members, for putting out that survey. It was, I've really, really appreciated it. And I spoke before at the last meeting. I have two plaques on the wharf. One belonged to my mother, one to my sister. I also think my plaques were probably lost, but I don't know. And if they are, and you, and uh, I, I is very important to me that that they remain where we purchased them. They're they're my mother's. It's my mother's grave that she was buried there at sea. 
Her celebration of life was in Capitola. Her plaque is there. It marks her resting place. And we go there all the time. It's like, it's when to me, when you offered a memorial plaque program, it was like, it is like their cemetery. And if there's damage to it, if I might, I would be happy to help pay for my, to replace my mother's plaque, it, you know, uh, but I really hope that you choose to let people whose loved ones have lived there on those railings and on those benches remain there. It seems very human to me and inhuman to not. And I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional, but anyway, and I really hope there's not an, an expiration date. And if more things happen and there's storms, which hopefully don't happen again for another 20 years, we, we can, we can, we, we can pay for our own plaques to be put back up. It's certainly worth it to me. I don't know about everybody else, but thank you. Thank you for your consideration anyway. Thank you. We do have one more speaker. Um, Joni S. You will have three minutes to speak once you unmute yourself. Okay. Hello. Um, my husband, Dan, and I uh, moved to Capitola in 2017, and we love it here. And we feel like we've basically been in heaven since we came over here. We're over the hill people and waited many, many years to save up enough to be able to buy something here. Anyways, we love Capitola dearly. This is our dream come true. And we love walking on the wharf and seeing all the plaques. And this is something that we appreciate. And I really think that the wall should be put back as it was as much as possible. It's just charming to walk along there and read the plaques and appreciate the love that was made with them. Um, we would also appreciate if there's a plan for people to purchase new plaques to help contribute to the rebuilding of the wharf as a fundraiser, possibly to help out those who can't afford to replace the plaques that were lost. And so we're hoping that that's something else that could happen, that new plaques could be purchased at um, by the community. And I think that no expiration date is a good idea. I think that this is something that I'm hoping if we can get a plaque that um, it would be there forever for our children, grandchildren, whatever, to come and visit and say, this is where Grampy and grandma are. I think that's just a precious thought and it's a unique thing to a beach community. And that's something that I know Capitola embraces. So thank you for listening. And um, those are our thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. So we cannot accept public comment from people who have already spoken. So if you've already commented on this item, we cannot accommodate uh, double commentary. So as of right now, there are no other new comments. Okay, great. Um, coming back, I think I just wanted to clarify on the term expiration date. I, I think that um, that's not really the direction that we were going. Um, it, it would be more along the lines of either a catastrophic event or something like that, where, um, may I? May yes. I so certainly was not my intention, and I apologize to um, imply that we would yank the plaques off after mm -hmm. a certain amount of time. So not, not an expiration date. We were recommending um, rather after a certain set amount of time, if something were to then occur, the city isn't guaranteeing everything will be immediately replaced. So that was more along the lines, I hope that addresses your question. Yes, um, just to clarify. And then um, I think there was a question about whether or not we know the inventory and then along with that, have has there been any discussion about um, funding from the people who wish to keep the plaques? So I can um, answer part of that at least. The wharf is inaccessible at this time. So staff is estimating based on 
you know, visuals of where the wharf is, is torn into, basically what may have been lost in that area. It's also possible that when we're removing plaques to rebuild the wharf, things may damage. We, we just don't know. So we don't have a, a list of everything that is missing. However, what we do have is um, an index and pictures of everything that was on the wharf before the storm in anticipation of this long planned wharf resiliency project. So we'll be able to rectify that with what we find on the wharf once it becomes accessible and safe for staff. Um, so that, I hope that answers the, the member of the public's question. And regarding funding, uh, that was included in the estimation of what the cost would be. To, we, the city was anticipating buying replacement plaques uh, under that option. Okay, I'm wondering if if there are members with their plaques that would like to repurchase perhaps, if that would offset some of the cost and then allow us to sort of look into um, both sort of options, replacing the ones that may have been lost and then also, you know, if there's other people coming into this that want to be a part of if we do a wall or something like that. That may be, may be a mouthful, but <laughs> or not the direction we're going in, but just a thought. Yeah, comment, please. Um, so I think it's a great idea. I'm glad we did the survey. Thank you for doing that. Absolutely. It, it makes sense that folks want their um, oh, it's very fancy up there. Um, do we need to fix that? Shall we wait? So my, I'm, I'm certain that our broadcaster is working on it as we speak in the back room. To the SoCal Creek Water <laughs> I, I can't okay. fix it, so I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Are we just still on? We're still live, though. Okay. Um, I think it makes sense to replace them. I'm behind replacing them. I understand it's a $22,000 cost. I would like, it would be a dream if we could get it reimbursed. That makes the most sense. Sure. Um, I think the, in terms of expiration, if, gosh, if I don't even want, I don't want, I want to knock on wood, if there's a horrible storm and our wharf goes again, um, I think maybe in terms of expiration or if something happened, then we would contact those that lost them and try to come up with some sort of split the cost efforts if FEMA or if it doesn't get refunded again, I think. Um, I you know, I believe that folks, when they bought them, truly believe that they would be there forever. I don't think it's fair to justify the back, at, you know, what people were thinking when they purchased them 50 years ago, 30 years ago. So, um, and it's it's unfortunate. And I know it's staff time. I know it's a long haul. Um, in regards to timeline, we are looking at the project being completed in about a year. So if by the end of next year, we, we have those up again, that seems reasonable. If project takes longer, that just is what happens. Um, so I'd like to move forward with that. Now with the wharf committee um, that's taking that project or it's taking that on with the mural and or adding more, I think that's great. I think folks in the community want to buy new ones and they can come up with a process on what that looks like and how many and so forth. Um, I believe in the survey, some folks said that they'd rather have it there. So maybe giving priority, if we can let the committee know that those folks have priority at, at no cost to them to replace them there. So in the 60 responses, 60 of them? 70. 70, mm -hmm. you know, 10 of them said they want to be on the, I think I did this last time, with the wave mural on the mm -hmm. wharf. Mm -hmm. You know, if 10 of them want to be there, I would hope that the committee would let them be there and then we would take care of the rest on the benches and the wharf and such. And, and um, cover that cost. So that's my just starting thoughts because um, I'm behind replacing them 100%. And I shared that last time. Um, yeah, I totally agree that it makes sense to uh, replace the plaques. But I was thinking that um, given that it was my understanding that in the original agreement, the um, language was that the plaques would be there for the life of the plaque, which mm -hmm to me kind of implies, you know, probably not the plaque itself. And 
I'm not saying for this time, but if we move forward, I think it would make sense to put them back and under the understanding that the wood is going to rot, the wharf isn't going to be there for all time, probably not as long as the bronze flax, and that the cost to replace the flax should be passed on to the individual who chooses and wants to maintain the plaque rather than the city funds. So my two cents, I think it would make sense that if people, you know, care about maintaining them for the next thousand years, that it doesn't fall on public funds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I think um, replacing them, it sounds like the way to, to go at this point. And also that if they need to be replaced in the future, that it not be with public funds. But I think there also needs to be something within that that they will be replaced if they are paid for, but there's also no guarantee that they will be replaced in the same spot in the event that there is another accident like the accident. In case there's another storm like this where the, you know, parts of the wharf fall into the ocean that we're gonna have this, this instance again. Um, but if we are considering a public art kind of um, plaque area for new plaques that if there's space and um, someone's plaque falls off again or is destroyed again or the wood it's on is destroyed again and they want to replace it, that it can go to the new art piece if there's space. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, I believe so. Thank you. So it sounds like to me that we're all looking forward to uh, replacing all the plaques, but now we're trying to come up with what to do in the event of another uh, wave event like we had. And, and your thought was to charge the people then at that time to replace them or it makes sense to me. I'm just looking at uh, better than putting a cap on it and uh, saying that we're going to take them off in 25 years. We could say if something happens again in order to get the plaques put, put up, then the owners of the plaque will have to pay for them. I think that's true. Yeah, I mean, I think th this is the kind of conversation that staff was suggesting when we were saying putting some sort of parameters on it, just just so that it's really clear. You know, and I'm really hoping that no one at this table is gonna be dealing with this again, when this is our opportunity to deal with it. But I think if this is the direction the council is going, and what I was hearing from a couple council members was the notion that we're going back this time, but in the future, should the wharf require rebuilding, it would have to repay. And I think what we would do then is, again, we don't have a motion yet, but if that was ultimately the motion, I think, the thing to do would be to put that into the policy to get it, because otherwise, otherwise, I don't know how in the world 20 years. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so really try to make it abundantly clear. So we would be following back up. So I think if you're looking for a motion this evening, giving us that direction to come back with a policy that clarifies it, figure out to the extent that you can as a, group, a body what that language would, uh, would look like. I, I think I would just add, though, that if we know that our insurance or FEMA or someone's going to cover it, so if we can include language in the policy that states we would seek reimbursement if something happened and if we got, you know, if we if it was covered, because this is a funding issue, right? We're, and we don't know the answer if it'll get covered now, but it sounds like there's consensus that either way we're moving forward. But in the policy, to be really specific, that we would make sure to, to seek reimbursement or to make sure that's included in the reimbursement um, when we would submit either the insurance claim or the FEMA thing. I think that's really important. My other point um, also is that for those who are listening and will have them replaced, I think it's important to also acknowledge that they might not be placed in the same spot. Um, and I, because that might be a challenge, I don't know if we've thought about that, but a bench might not be in the same spot or um, just be mindful of that. I'm just saying that that might not happen for everyone. Is that true or can we make that I'm looking at Jessica because that's probably really hard, right? I mean, yeah. Um, we don't have a map of everything, I'm guessing. We, we, just to clarify, we have a map. We know which plaques were on the wharf, but I guess what we're saying is if yours was third down from the entrance, it might be the fourth now or something because... And it's going to look different, the wharf, a little bit. It's going to bend right. in in certain yeah. places. And so I just want our audience to know that literally the wharf will look different. And so your plaque might not be in the exact same spot. I think that's fair to, to be honest with the. Absolutely, I think the intention is to, to mimic what we have, but as you've stated, like the wharf will be different. Yeah, 
as a whole. So that is our intention, but the flexibility that you're, you're mentioning is appreciated because I know that is a concern of staff. And I would just add that I would, I would recommend not putting any by the bathroom. Thank you. Let's just make sure that doesn't happen. Bathroom. No. Not by the bathroom. Okay. I had um, just one more thought that um, I'm not sure if city council would really have jurisdiction over the art piece or if that's being handled by the wharf improvement committee. Um, no. Yeah, but uh, either way, I think it would be a good idea to include this, you know, same language or similar language and think about these issues for the potential art piece with flex. Mm -hmm. um, and now that we know that, you know, it's a, something that needs to be thought about or an accident happens. Great. Okay, so did we have a full motion? No. All right. Uh, I will then make a motion. Can we get the, was there a slide with like language that I can use? I'm looking on the staff report, but. So I'll uh, make a motion to direct staff to reinstall all the memorial plaques and to, what would it be, return to us with the policy, with the language that we've provided this evening? Does that sound good? Okay. I'll second that. Great. We have a motion and a second. Maybe we have a roll call, please. Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Clark? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. Vice Mayor Brown? Aye. And Mayor Kaiser? Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you Thank all. You. Okay, so we will move on to 7D. Uh, this is the 1098 38th Avenue project um, introduction and the funding request brought to us by Ms. Hurley. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, this evening I'm going to present 1098 38th Avenue. Uh, uh, we'll give you an overview of the pr uh, project and the funding request. So I have a few slides and then I'll introduce you to the MidPen team. So tonight you'll be hearing from MidPen Housing. They're a regional nonprofit affordable housing developer. They've done a lot of different projects throughout our region, um, including projects in Watsonville, they have an office in Watsonville locally, um, Live Oak, they've done projects, Santa Cruz, they'll, they'll get into that in their presentation. They're kind of an all-in-one um, nonprofit in that they'll go through the construction, they'll manage the project, and then they'll, I'm sorry, I got cut out of my slide, but um, provide um, uh, resources for the people living within their developments. Um, in MidPen purchased this project this March. Uh, they're planning on, they'd like to build a 52 unit multifamily housing development. They'll be 100% affordable. And this evening they're requesting $250,000 for pre development planning costs. Um, and this slide shows the available funds that we have that uh, are restricted to housing. We were recently awarded our PLHA funding, which comes in from those real estate transactions of $75 every time a real estate transaction happens. Current um, uh, allowance there is $481,000. We also have housing successor agency funds of $2 million, approximately $2 million for a loan that was paid off from Castle Mobile Home Estates. And then home funds, we have over $600,000 um, due to uh, uh, multiple loans being paid off in the last few years. So. Um, if there is conceptual support for the project, staff will come back and make a recommendation on which fund would be most appropriate. So with that, I'm going to turn this over um, to the MidPen team. I think Alyssa Serrano is going to kick it off. And Alyssa, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, City Council. My name is Alyssa Serrano, and I'm representing MidPen Housing and really excited to talk to you more about our proposal for the site. Next slide. 
So Midpen Housing, we are an affordable nonprofit developer. We have properties in 11 counties in the greater Bay Area region. So as far up as Sonoma County and as far south as Monterey County. And this would actually be our first project in Capitola, which is be really exciting. Our mission is to build communities that give residents the opportunity to have safe and long lasting housing from the beginning of a project to the end. We really um, like to focus on our community engagement just to make sure we're bringing the region the best possible property to live at. Uh, we've recently been ranked number 21 in affordable de developers in the country, but at the end of the day, what's really important to us is creating homes for those who need it and for um, providing homes to people of different backgrounds and across cities that desperately need the affordable housing. Next slide. So this is our team. Uh, this project would be based out of our Watsonville office, like Katie said. Uh, Shweta Subramanian is our chief real estate development officer. Um, Joanna Carmen, who is here tonight, is the director of development. That's me, Alyssa Serrano. And then the project manager for this site is Vanessa Diffenbach. So here's just a quick snapshot of some of our local communities. So we have family housing in Soquel. That property is called The Farm. That's consisting of 39 units for families. Another family housing project we have is in Aptos called Parkhurst Terrace. Down in the left-hand corner is Moongate Plaza located in the city of Salinas. And that's an example of one of our permanent supportive housing projects. So that's 90 units for individuals with special needs. And another population we serve is farm workers. So uh, San Andreas on the right-hand corner is located in Watsonville and it's farm worker housing. Another property we didn't include here, um, but we are the developer of is Vienna Star Plaza, which is located on 1500 Capitola Road. And that's a partnership with Dentist Community Dental and Santa Cruz Community Health. So like Katie mentioned, under MidPen Housing Corporation, we also have a property management company. And they really focus on the day-to-day -day interactions with the residents and just making sure all is well at the property and making sure their needs are met as well as maintain good relationships with external neighbors in the surrounding area. Our operations and maintenance team are the people that um, keep our properties looking really beautiful and help sustain the property for the long-term use. Next slide, please. Our resident services department um, really tailors specific programs depending on the population that's living at the site. So that might look like youth after school help, homework help for our family properties or uh, senior activities at our senior properties. And our supportive services would come in uh, for more one-on-one -on -one case management. Um, so overall, we can provide a variety of different resources, um, but really tailored to the specific need of that development. So that brings us to our site, uh, which like Katie mentioned, we acquired in March. So we will be getting into the site amenities and the surroundings in later slides, but just the basics is that it's located on 30th Avenue. Uh, the street parallel is 41st Avenue, which is a very um, lot, a lot of different things going on there. Um, bordering the site is also the rail, the future rail trail. This aerial shot does show that there's existing structures, but those were demolished before we purchased the site. So as you can see in the photo, it's vacant. There's no um, operations happening there right now. It's a, there's just some trees and the rest is vacant. <laughs> so our overall vision for this site is to have 52 units of 100% affordable housing for families. 25% of those units will be set aside for special needs individuals. So that comes out to 13 units. And we're defining affordable housing here to serve residents earning 30 to 60% of the area median income. And it's based on the current area median income. So that could shift, but th these are the estimate rent ranges for right now for ones, twos, and three bedrooms. So starting at the lower end for extremely low income at 30% and moving to the higher range as we get to 60% AMI level. And I'm going to pass it to our architect to share really exciting site plan designs. Thank you. 
Awesome. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Alyssa. Council members, thank you for having us here today. We're really excited to share with you more about this project. Um, a little bit about our team. We are Architects Fora. Uh, I, my name is Sarah Vaccaro, Principal and Architect with the firm. I represent our equitable communities focus. I'm joined by Jessica Goswick here, and then our other two team members, Yoshi and Kyle, are likely listening in virtually today. Next slide, please. Site context. Okay, let's see. <laughs> no, that, no, that's perfect. Um, so as Alyssa already walked through, our site is on the kind of lower west side of town in a part of uh, the town's boundary that is surrounded by county land around us. Uh, it is an almost two acre site. Uh, we are currently zoned multifamily residential, medium density. Uh, within the current zoning, we are going to uh, comply with most of the current uh, zoning requirements. So it is currently zoned for um, 15 dwelling units per acre. And with the state density bonus increase, we'll be increasing that up to 26 dwelling units per acre. So on a two acre site, that'll be the 52 units that we've talked about. Um, our site design will comply with the building coverage maximums as well as the open common space minimums. Um, the current height maximum for the site is 30 feet. We are proposing a mixture of two-story and three-story buildings, so we might need to seek a concession to pop up above that 30-foot height limit to probably serve three stories, but it would only be about five extra feet likely. Next slide. A little bit about the context and character of this 41st Avenue West Capitol area. Uh, it's a uh, got a lot of wonderful characteristics that we've been admiring and um, inspiring our design. Uh, it's a b beautiful blend of commercial and residential all within a walkable and bikeable distance. The beach town aesthetic comes through in the architecture and the creative artwork and in the bikers that have adapted their bikes to hold surfboards. Um, while many of the residential homes were built in the 70s and the 80s, we are seeing a lot of newer developments of ADUs being added to sites like often in the rear and often two-story, as well as some newer, more contemporary homes. Next slide, please. So views around the immediate site. Um, we have mobile home, we have three mobile home park communities um, surrounding our site on the south and to the west. And then across the rail trail along the northern portion of our site are mostly single family homes, ones and two stories. And then to the east is the 41st. Uh, mixed use commercial and residential or commercial mixed use area. Next slide. In our next slide. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so Mid Penn and our team have spent uh, a lot of time developing our project goals, and these will be the, the the parameters that we use to make design decisions as well as to me to measure our success of this project. So first and foremost, we are aiming to provide affordable, inclusive family housing that reflects and supports this community. Um, we want to ensure programs, resources, and physical design provide equitable living op opportunities for all residents. Uh, we'd like to focus our investment where it has the most impact on the health and the living standards for our residents. And we want to integrate thoughtful, multi-use, multi-age outdoor spaces to take advantage of the wonderful Capitola environment. And it's all about the details. We want to feature art, outdoor spaces, color that all emphasizes and reflect the Capitola vibe that is so special. Next slide. So here's our proposed site design. Um, <clears throat> so we are fronting 31st, 38th Avenue, excuse me, on the left. It's a rather narrow street frontage. And then the site is rather deep. It's about 500 feet in depth. Um, so at the street, we are proposing, uh, or I'm sorry, we are proposing four buildings clustered around outdoor spaces. And that's to minimize the, the size and scale um, to better reflect the surrounding residential community. Uh, the two buildings along the front, we're trying to create a strong street facade as well as a corner facade facing the rail trail with really clear um, breaks in the buildings to provide entrance for pedestrians and bikes. Um, we're clustering most of our common area spaces, the community room, offices, resident support spaces around that first courtyard that you see, that'll have lovely southern exposure, be a really bright, daylit, active court, um, courtyard with outdoor dining spaces, gathering spaces for the residents, a lot of indoor-outdoor connections, really vibrant, 
as well as some ping pong tables, shuffleboard to bring a little fun uh, to the courtyard spaces. And the rear two buildings cluster around um, the second courtyard space that will face north to the rail trail. And the, the activities in the space are really centered around children and youth having um, safe, protected outdoor places to, to play that are adjacent to some of the common room spaces so parents have the ability to, to, to see their children as they're doing day-to-day -day life um, things. We also have some raised garden beds along the, the rail trail corridor there. The two rear buildings also create a gateway from the rear parking area. We are um, providing most of the parking for the site in the rear setback, um, and that's uh, to, to, to provide as many parking spaces as possible to serve the residents. We'll have a driveway access road along the southern edge of the site, and that will have some planted buffers, as well as just the, the width of the road to provide a buffer between our buildings and the, the mobile home park to the south. Um, we are proposing 52 units, as we talked about. The majority of them will be two bedrooms and three bedrooms, over 50%, or 50%, I should say. And then the rest will be one bedrooms with a couple studios. Um, we're providing 67 parking spaces, or proposing, um, and that provides us a one-to-one -one parking ratio for the one bedrooms and studio units, and then a 1.5 to one um, for the larger two and three bedroom units. Next slide. Oh, and project and amenities. So on site, we'll be providing property management, resident services, offices, and spaces. We'll have a large community room with a kitchen that will open up to the outdoor courtyards. We'll have two laundry rooms, um, outdoor play spaces for children and youth, as we mentioned, as well as dining and gathering spaces to foster community amongst the residents. And we do have high resiliency and sustainability goals for the project of an all-electric building with on-site power generation. Next slide. Pass it off. Thank you so much, Sarah. So um, as mentioned by my colleague, Alyssa, my name is Joanna Carmen. I'm the Director of Development for Midpens Watsonville Office. I'm excited to be here today and really looking forward to working with all of you to bring more affordable housing to Capitola, so thank you. So you can see here our preliminary project schedule. This is as of now, and with this currently proposed project, as was just described to you today, we expect we would be able to receive our entitlements and local approvals within about a year or so, which would allow us to move forward with starting to apply for the funding required to build this project. Um, that would, hopefully, we would be able to start applying for financing in mid-2024 with the goal of breaking ground at the end of 2025. Next slide, please. So in that schedule, you likely noticed multiple financing applications built in. That is because affordable housing finance does have multiple layers. So I did just want to take a second to kind of break down some of the bigger pieces. So the tax credit equity that you see here refers to, it's about half of the sources that we bring in to build our housing. Um, this comes from the federal low-income housing tax credit, which is allocated to the states um, based on population. We, MidPen, would then go and apply for the low-income housing tax credit from the state. And as a nonprofit affordable housing developer, we, would, we don't have a large tax liability, so we sell those tax credits to those that have larger tax liabilities, typically banks or other syndicators which bring together a pool of investors. They buy those tax credits from us, and then we turn around, and in return, we build uh, safe, high-quality, affordable housing and maintain it at affordable rents over 55 years. So that's sort of the exchange there. And then there's the conventional debt is referring to basically our mortgage. Um, unlike on market rate projects, our permanent mortgage is a lot smaller of a piece of the pie because we're restricting rents to affordable levels for extremely low to low income um, levels in, in, in each county. And um, in this scenario, however, you're seeing, we are currently projecting that our partners at the Housing Authority, that we would hopefully be successful in bringing in some project-based vouchers. And so that allows us to take on a slightly higher debt than if we, through the voucher program. So that's there, and then we do expect to be able to apply for state funding to cover the majority of the remaining amount with local sources providing that final gap source. We're currently projecting a total development cost of approximately $46 million. This is based on some recent projects that we have in construction right now with an appropriate escalator. 
Um, and this is all as we see it today and likely to change as the current markets and financing environments shift. Next slide. So that just brings us to our more formal request. We are respectfully requesting and inviting the city to join us as partners in getting this project started with a pre-development loan of 250,000. This, combined with funds already provided by MidPen, will allow us to move into and complete our community engagement process and entitlement approvals. We appreciate your time and consideration, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have as this meeting continues. Um, as mentioned, in addition to myself, Sarah, and Alyssa, um, Vanessa Diffenbrod, the project manager, is also here to answer any questions today. So thank you so much and appreciate your time. Great, thank you. And I just want to add that um, we do anticipate that as their project moves forward that they would po probably be coming back to us to looking for additional funds for that gap um, for local funding as well. So our recommendation tonight is to direct staff to prepare a loan agreement to assist pre-development activities for the 100% affordable multifamily residential development um, or future development located at 1098 38th Avenue. And with that, we I'm available for questions and mid-pen as well. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have council questions? I have one question. That you talked about the parking. Was it 62 spots? Is yeah. that was that the? <laughs> Currently showing 67 parking spaces. 67. I have um, really enjoyed seeing what you have done down like at 295 San Andreas. It's it's a great place. We I worked for the sheriff's office and we used to have a lot of calls there. Mid Penn went in and, and made a beautiful uh, apartment complex and changed a lot of things. One of the things though, they had even more parking per unit than what we're planning, but several people park along San Andreas Road, which is which is fine. It's, it's a public roadway. But what this project being said, there's not any off-street parking on 30th Avenue, so maybe we could look at increasing our parking numbers um, to help the people that live there. Wouldn't be fair for them to not have a place to park. Thank you. Okay, no other questions. We can go out to public comment. If there's anybody in person that would like to speak. Mayor Kaiser, council members, I'm Tracy Weiss. I am here representing O'Neill um, as a neighbor and part of the business that is adjacent to this project. We just wanted to show our support and our presence here this evening as we're following along. So I just wanted to say thank you for your consideration and we're here just kind of following along. So thank you. That's great, thank you. Anybody else in house? I don't see any. Do we have anybody online? We don't have any speakers on Zoom, Mayor. Okay, great. Well, we can take it back to Council for deliberation. I would like to make a motion to um, direct staff to prepare a loan agreement to assist with or pre-development activities for 100% affordable multifamily rental housing development located on 1098 38th Avenue. Second. First and a second. May we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Clark? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. Vice Mayor Brown? Aye. And Mayor Kaiser? Aye. Thank you. That passes unanimously. So I think we are sort of at our six o'clock mark here. We're going to take a brief recess. We'll adjourn back at 6 10? 6 6 12. We're going to. Okay. Is that what you just said? <laughs> oh, 20 minutes. <laughs> cool. Let's go with 620 then. Uh, grab a drink, a snack, stretch your legs, use the restroom, and we'll be back. All right. Welcome back to the regular scheduled city council meeting. We are going to pick back up at item 7E, which is the levy of Capitola Village and Wharf Business Improvement Area Assessments for the fiscal year 23-24. And we have Jim here. Good evening, Mayor and Council. As um, this is the cap annual Capitola Village and Wharf Business Area Improvement Area Assessments. 
Um, just by way of background, the BIA was formed back in June of uh, 2005 with the adoption of Ordinance 889. And the BIA, for those of you unaware, is a business-based self-imposed assessment district in which the businesses pay the assessments within the district for improvements and activities that support, revitalize, and attract tourists to those businesses. The assessments for fiscal year 23-24 are the same as they have been for the previous two years. Prior two years, we had reduced the, the hotels by 50%, everybody else by 25% in response to the pandemic. We're holding those same um, assessment amounts for this year as those businesses kind of recover from the storm damage that they suffered in January. Um, they also normally would be business that can make uh, low payments in the form of gift, gift certificates, however, as with the last two years, we're not doing the in-lieu payments this year since we've done the business assessment. Um, so um, on May 25th, City Council set this evening as the public hearing, and this public hearing was noticed, Santa Cruz Sentinel mailed to all the affected business owners. California state law require, and our moving code require that prior to approving the assessments, we conduct a public hearing and that the BIA submits an annual plan and budget for council with the agenda packet. And also, I think a couple times because we have the budget later. Um, and as a reminder, there's no fiscal impact to the city as all services provided by the city are reimbursed by the BIA. Um, also, in addition to the um, assessments that the businesses pay, they also receive a portion of restricted transit occupancy tax revenue as a result of Measure J, which was um, approved by voters in 2018. In February of 19, following that election, the City Council directed TOT revenues for restricted and local business groups to be split evenly between the BIA and the Chamber so Capitola SoCal Chamber of Commerce. We've continued that, um, but they've also, uh, at the time, required that a minimum of 25% of the restricted TOT goes to uh, village enhancements which includes um, holidays and special events, and that the restricted TOT portion, revenue portion will be separated out in the budget from the assessments, which we have done, and that the um, annual report that's in the agenda packet also describes how those um, restricted TOT revenues were spent. Um, so for fiscal year 23-24, we're estimating that they'll receive about 35,000 restricted TOT. Um, you can see up there that basically $31,000 out of the 35 is going to village enhancements, holidays, and events, with only 4,000 going towards um, direct reporting. So easily breaking through that threshold of 25% going towards the um, council's directing the uses. Next slide. Up on the screen now are the amounts for the different um, businesses. So the assessments are arrived by the type of business and the number of employees that have, you can read all of those. I mean, I don't want me to read them to you. That they're basically the same as they have been for the last two years. And so our recommended action this evening is to conduct the public hearing and adopt the proposed resolution levying the fiscal year 23-24 Capitola Village Fourth Business Business Improvement Area Assessments, accepting the BIA annual plan and budget. And with that, I'm happy to any answer any questions, and I also have representatives from the BIA if you have questions for them as well. Great. Any questions from Council? No? All right. Any members of the public wish to speak on this item? I don't see any here. Do you have anybody online? We don't have any speakers with their hands raised, Mayor. Great. We can go back to Council for deliberation. I'm pulling it up one second. Oh, I was too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's scrolling really slow on my end. I'd like to make a motion to um, this evening to conduct the public hearing and adopt the proposed resolution levying the fiscal year 23-24 Capitola Village and Wharf Business Improvement Area Assessment and accepting the BIA annual plan and budget. I'll second. Great. We have a motion and a second. We have a roll call, please. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. 
Councilmember Clark? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. Vice Mayor Brown? Aye. And Mayor Kaiser? Aye. That passes unanimously. It will take us to item F, which is the fiscal year 23 24 budget and capital improvement program. Back to Jim. May 18th, I think. Um, meeting gave direction for to come back this evening for budget adoption. Next slide, hopefully. Yeah, sorry. I had the last one memorized. So just to kind of review what we've gone through over the last couple of months, the operating budget for this year is imbalanced by design as we utilize um, available resources for city council goals. However, we are projecting an ending fund balance in June 30th of 2024 of 1.6 million, roughly. Um, that consists of $100,000 set aside for the Employee Down Payment Assistance Program, $954,000 set aside for future capital projects, and $500,000 as a target fund balance that we never like to go below. Um, again, just under $5 million going to of general fund resources going to capital improvement projects and city council goals. And I'll go quickly through those. The um, Jade Street Community Center renovation, we have 1.65 million. Um, paying off the Santa Cruz County Bank loan, 725,000. Uh, $500,000 for pavement management, 235 for PD technology upgrades, 200,000 for universal design playground, and $2,000 for um, replacing our existing fleet with electric vehicles, next slide. <clears throat> we also have uh, 50,000 set aside or program for establishing uh, city council long-term strategic goals, 30,000 set aside for LAFCA's uh, sphere, sphere of influence study, a survey, uh, we've have, we earmarked $25,000 just in case we wanna put, uh, do any surveying for potential ballot measures at the next election. Um, Mall redevelopment committee, 25,000, we have 150 set aside for capital improvement projects, which include uh, 50,000 each for water filling stations. And then these next two are just kind of seed, seed money for these future projects, um, Hill and Bay pilot project and Esplanade Park project. We also have $250,000. As we go through the, um, all of the projects related to the storm damage as um, Director Kahn mentioned earlier, we have to pay for about 6.25% of all of those damages. We're estimating that to be about $250,000 that would come out of our emergency reserve, so we'll be replenishing that as well at the same time. Um, again, the Employee Down Payment Assistance Program and Future Capital Projects. Next slide. And then a few of the um, non-monetary City Council goals that we've added into this last version that I had left out in the previous draft is um, Adopt the Children's Bill of Rights, which I think we're bringing in July. Bringing climate goals to the City Council, and that's from our um, climate action plan. Reaching out to the school district for a possible turf project at Monterey Park. Encouraging local businesses to participate in the California Green Business Certification Program. Exploring grants for a potential maker space at the community center. And researching um, intergenerational programs to connect youth with uh, seniors and elders possibly utilizing the Early Childhood Youth Program funding. Um, as far as uh, new projects getting funding, I kind of touched on these, but they're the um, Jade Street uh, Universally Acceptable Accessible Playground, 200,000, the Community Center again, pavement management, and also up there is the Capitola Road Rehabilitation, 
those funds are um, three different funding sources uh, that have been uh, that are uh, restricted for road projects only, not general fund money. Next slide, please. I'm at the May 18th meeting. City Council gave us um, some additional direction as far as getting the final budget ready, proposed budget ready for adoption, and that included allocating 23,000 of ECYP funding to the Recreation Division um, for that particular restricted fund. And then on the general fund, we have net increases of a little under 25,000. Um, it's actually a decrease in recreation funding of 5,000. It's the 23,000 that we took that we're funding now with ECYP funds, but we added 18,000 for the Equity Swim Program. Um, I had to increase the personnel cost. I had some estimates in there as negotiations were going on. I was a little bit shy there. Also, increased contract services, $30,000 for a total comp compensation study. And we decreased the 911 JPA contribution by 2,900. They um, adopted their budget, and I was a little bit high on that estimate. And then also, those non monetary um, city council goals have now been added into the city manager message, but we list all the other. Um, at mid-year, which we discussed a little bit earlier, uh, we'll be, as always, evaluating sales tax revenues over the next two quarters, also watching our some of our other key revenue sources, the TOT, cannabis, um, building permits, business license, that stuff. Um, there is the potential. We did the second reading of the ordinance for the parking meter rates. If that goes through Coastal Commission, as we hope, then there is the potential to be increasing parking revenue at mid-year. Um, and I believe Council Member mentioned that we do have that 1.6 million of fund balance and at mid-year we could reconsider how we want to hold on to that or or um, start programming those funds so this is a busy one um, so general funds stru is structurally balanced but again it's out of out of balance this year intentionally but we are balanced next year for the next three years up until measure F sunsets in December of 2027 in which that time we do at this point our estimate our projections show us being um, unbalanced. Our reserves remain at target levels all the way through there. On the revenue side, uh, sales tax, TOT, continue to perform strong. But again, as the economy is changing and, and everything, we always keep a real close eye on those things. Um, on the expenditure side, our services are remaining at pre-pandemic levels. So we had ratcheted stuff back, but we brought all that stuff back last, last year and continue to do that. Um, the community grant program, we're still using a combination of general fund and CDBG coronavirus grant funding to fund the community grant program through this year and possibly next. And the last thing on that, oh, um, during the pandemic, we had frozen seven positions. We've been slowly bringing those back in this budget. We'll return the last one and a half that was frozen and we'll be out of that kind of freezing of positions during the pandemic. And so our recommended action this evening is to approve the resolution adopting the fiscal year 2023-2024 operating budget and capital improvement program. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions? Is the 1.6 million, is that um, the earmark from Assembly Member Addis's? So no. Do we have a timeline on that, Jamie? So the question is about <clears throat> whether or not we might be able to get a state earmark to assist with the community center. I've been in touch with their offices. They've told me that we should really know in the next four weeks, four to five weeks, uh, whether or not that's ultimately successful. Great. And then um, we received a bid on the wharf project that came in under. Are we seeing that reflected here at all? We, we have not reduced the budget for the wharf because um, when you add in what your typical contingencies are for a construction project, especially one that's taking place out in the ocean, we think that we need to hold on to that budget for right now to allow for any contingencies that come up during the project. But if we end under budget, then that would definitely come back in. And remind me when we can, we've already approved obviously the conceptual design, but um, I think one of the elements that I miss I forgot, I missed, um, is about a kiosk. And I'm just wondering at what point can we discuss that? I mean, now that we know we're under bid, but um, in terms of the budget here, do I need to identify that today or during mid-year in March? So I think the next opportunity to talk about the wharf is gonna be our next meeting in July. 
Um, at that point, we're going to be talking about the kind of RRM design enhancement enhancements. And so if there's other kind of enhancements or elements we want to talk about adding into the war, if that's the opportunity to do it. Great. Thank you. Those are all my questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can go out to public comment on this item as well. If there's anybody in house that wishes to speak, I don't see any. Do we have anybody online? There are no hands raised on Zoom, Mayor. Great, thank you. Okay, we'll come back to council for deliberation. Uh, <clears throat> all right, uh, I will go ahead and make a motion to adopt the recommended action, uh, adopting a resolution. Adopt a resolution adopting the City of Capitola's fiscal year 23-24 budget and capital improvement program. I'll second. Great. We have a motion and a second. Maybe we have a roll call. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Clark. Aye. Councilmember Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Brown. Aye. And Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Thank you. Passes unanimously. We'll take us to item 7G, which is the fiscal year 23-24 fee schedule, which will also be presented by Jim. Thank you, Mayor Kaiser. Okay, I think this is my last one for the evening. <laughs> uh, fiscal year 23-24 fee schedule. So by uh, just a little bit of background, annually we review the fee schedule as part of the budget process. Our current fee schedule um, was the result of a fee study that was adopted back in November of 2015. And at that time, the consultant recommended that we review it each year and um, potentially do consumer price index increases. Most fees have been increased each year by the San Francisco Bay Area annual CPI, and which for 23-24, which is calendar year 22, um, CPI is 5.6%. The staff is recommending that we increase fees by 5.6%. Um, our history over the last few years, um, you can see up there, that in 2021, as a result of the pandemic, we did not increase fees, um, but each year before and after we have by, by the San Francisco Bay Area CPI next year. Um, so we have been, every best management practices is to conduct a comprehensive fee schedule every five years. We kind of had that on the docket to do in January of 2020, and then um, everything kind of fell apart. So we pumped the brakes on that, and we've been holding off doing a fee study and just kind of getting through the pandemic and all of that. Um, this year, the budget you just adopted it includes money to uh, perform a cost of service fee study. So we'll be going through all of those fees. Um, I have an RFP ready to go in early uh, July. We anticipate being back in front of city council late in calendar year 23 or early in 2024. And that um, fee study with fee adjustments tentatively going into effect at this time next year. The fee study will look at all of the stuff. So just because we're doing a fee study doesn't automatically mean fees go up. If we look that we've gained efficiencies over time, some fees could actually come down. So it's really based on what is our level of effort and, and our cost for each of the services. I just want to make sure that everybody's clear that fee study doesn't automatically mean an increase. Next slide, please. Um, so we do have a few proposed fee amendments for this year, um, starting with the police department. We'd like to uh, do the addition of a firearm dealer license, city application fee of $100, um, the addition of ca carrying a concealed weapon permit application fee of $115. Both of those are based on the time that it takes um, PD staff to process those applications. And then removal of the animal service fees imposed and collected by Santa Cruz County. When we were going through it this year, we realized that we're, those are fees that are imposed and collected by the county, and we're actually the only city that puts it in there. Decided just it's not really one of our fees that we do anything with, so we're taking that one back out. We can put a link on our website that links folks back, which is what all the other jurisdictions and they links them back to the county website where the fees are. Next slide. Um, for the recreation department, we have a few to add, um, which are a drop in and workshop registration fee of ten dollars, um, a July drop in activity fee, which is prorated cost of session. So if they start after the starts that they're, it's prorated they're not charged the full amount the addition of a parents night out of um, 25 to 31 dollars I think that's resident non-resident addition of daily rate program fee 3442 again resident non-resident and then um, 
the addition of the art and cultural merchandise fee, which is cost plus, I'm gonna go through these next three here, cost plus 50%, the plein air application fee of $50, and the plein air art exhibition fee of 30%, or exhibition fee of which 30% is retained by the city, 70% by the artists. We've actually had these fees in place for a few years. They just were inadvertently left off the fee schedule. So I'm couching them as new, but several of those have been going on for a little bit. Um, next slide. So our recommended, recommended action is to conduct the notice public hearing and adopt the resolution adopting the fee schedule for 23-24. I'm happy to answer any questions. From Council, Jim, I'm confused why we're bringing this forward today, but we're going to go out for the assessment. What was the timeline on that again? For the cost of fee service study? Yeah. Uh, I'll be put, issuing an RFP probably in early July. That's at least a six month, probably longer process. So we're doing the fee schedule for 23 24. The cost of fee study is going to be for what the 20. fees are for the next fiscal year. Okay. I don't think this would live here, but our gun buyback program, where is that living? Is that living? Is that that a, lives within fee, the, but that's a. No, it's not a fee. It lives within the police department um, okay. operational budget, their law enforcement operational budget. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it was brought to my attention that uh, the fee schedule for the bandstand in Esplanade Park. Um, rental for four hours is $240, but then for the whole day, it's like $800. So I looked back at the original fee study, and um, the four hours, when I broke down the hourly rate, I think what they were thinking at the time was that you could do it for four hours, or a whole day would get you 12 hours. So that's why it was basically three times more. City Council definitely has the discretion to charge less than what that fee study said. We just can't go over so if there was an appetite by the council to maybe make that double, we, we could definitely make that amendment if you choose. Yeah, I haven't heard some concern from some people that want to try to have events and they say they just can't do the whole eight hours. So but maybe we could bring it down to reflect four hours and four hours. If you do the math, that's a lot, a lot of less than $800. Yeah, no, we could definitely, I think it'd come out to like 492 rather than the 800. So just, just to make sure it's clear for the record, if we're going to do that, the direction would be to go to basically twice the four-hour rate for the bandstand, which is about 240 for a full-day bandstand rental, because Council Member Clark is exactly right. It's, it's, I didn't realize where the math came from, but it's, three, it's really expensive for a full day on the bandstand, and so almost nobody ever does it. They just do the four-hour increments, and it seems more logical in my mind, too have something that's more in line with kind of double the four hour rate for the full day. And I, I think um, when we do the fee study in this coming fiscal year, we could also look at maybe having a four hour rate and then each additional hour beyond so that we're not, if you either, if you go to five hours, you don't have to pay for 12. So that might be a little more user friendly than the way it's structured right now. Okay. Great. Right. Do we have any public comment on this item? I don't see anybody here. Anybody online? There are no hands raised on Zoom. Great. Thank you. We'll come back to council. Should I make the motion that we approve the fiscal year 2023-24 fee schedule? Does that include? Yeah, I think we'll have to. Add. I thought staff was going to be looking into that and then coming back to us, or should we include that now? I, my recommendation, and you me is to revise the make the whole day the double the four hour rate and then we'll come back with a better rate right in, in my motion i would like to include that i'll second that great we have a motion oh i just see um do you, do you think we should do like hourly though instead is there i mean there's Anything chunks of after it after the four hours so at minimum it's four hours but if like the hula folks or the wanted to rent it for like an hour or two I'm just wondering how often, or was there some thought or policy behind that? So I don't we actually that. have, not to do a bandstand sort of deep dive, but we actually have an open play time at the bandstand on Sunday mornings, which is when Hula and the, thank you, ukuleles are out there playing. <clears throat> so anyone can go there 
No amplified music, no drums. But other than that, the bandstand is open for play. So they're not needing to reserve it or pay for it, uh, the people that you're seeing then. The, the bandstand reservation fee is really about people that are setting up bands, setting up um, amplified music, using it for those purposes. So in general, it's mostly the festivals. Uh, the BIA gets it sometimes. Um, but those are the folks who usually who pay for the bandstand rentals. I mean, my, yeah, my suggestion is is go with a four hour for because usually a band performance it's four hours, right? It's you know an hour set up, two hour performance. Um, if it's been working, I'm fine with. It. I just wanted to see if that would just alleviate some of the concerns that Councilmember Clark was suggesting. You know, if there it just makes sense to do it. Was, it would also be easier, like um, Jim said, to go beyond the four hour. You know, somewhere between four and eight or 12 hours if we just had a single policy saying it's by the hour that might be the simplest thing to do it's on the 244 hours yeah whatever that divide still yeah divided by four but why why should we i guess like how would that benefit us when it would provide potential flexibility for people to utilize the space you know what what's the benefit to the city to have a baseline well, of four so hours? then what is the policy exactly so what if one person rents it for an hour and then the, another per, like who is responsible for manning the bandstand and regulating whether or not these people are using it for the allotted time right i i, I do yeah I, I i do think that, that that's a really good point is that there's sort of like a baseline level of work involved with running the bandstand and just in terms of getting somebody with their insurance information setting them up like all of those things i haven't seen people want to use it for you know really short periods of time and other than one recent example of a tv station i haven't heard of anybody ever complaining about the four-hour rental fee you know usually if you're pulling in a sound system you're pulling in a band 240 bucks for the bandstand is not a big deal I think it would be great if we can get the, I think it goes to the police department, if we can get the application at least just to state where it's coming from. If it's like, at min, you know, to apply for this permit, it has to be a minimum of, of four hours, you know, it, it, based off of the comments you're making. I just want to be clear in the in what we're writing so that it correlates to our fee schedule, you know, that it goes hand in hand, not that we have to kind of come up with why, where we can, you know, like this conversation and watching the minutes back at a different time if this comes up. I think I understand. So the, the form will just say four hour rental, 240, all day rental. What is that four? There's no in between. Yeah. Does that work? Is that? I think we were talking about, yeah, that there was four or eight now. And then what was it next year? Or staff would come back to us with options for what it might look like for four and then every hour after four. So if you want to do five or six, but nothing below four, because based on the staff time, and like the mayor said, then who's going to be enforcing, who's going to be down there enforcing? Like you had this for two hours and your two hours is up and now my two hours starts. Right. Um, so, I mean, I think for tonight, I'm happy to move forward with Council Member Clark's suggestion of the four hours and then eight hours is double what a four hours cost and then staff can come back to us with additional recommendations for other alternatives. I can get behind that. I just want to make sure that the application is very clear. Yeah. Did we, we had a second. So we do have a motion and a second on the floor. Are you guys ready? Thank you. <laughs> I think we're ready now. <laughs> May we please have a roll call? Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Clark. Aye. Uh, Councilor Peterson, aye. Vice Mayor Brown, aye. and Mayor Kaiser. Aye, thank you. Also passes unanimously. So we'll do a redirection of the agenda here, um, and we'll move it back up to what would have been 7A, the Capitol Bar and Grill Entertainment Permit Appeal. Um, unfortunately, I need to recuse from this item due to my employment at a neighboring restaurant. So I'm going to turn the floor over to our Vice Mayor, Kristen. All right. Thank you. We'll give the mayor a moment to exit the dais.
All right. Uh, so as mentioned, we are returning to item 7A, uh, Capitola Bar and Grill Entertainment Permit Appeal. The recommended action for this item is to adopt a resolution denying an appeal of the city manager's decision to deny an application for a 2023 regular entertainment permit for Capitola Bar and Grill. Uh, there's a series of steps in the procedure for tonight's appeal. Um, I will turn it now to our city attorney to describe the procedural framework and standard of review for tonight's hearing. Thank you, Vice Mayor. <laughs> Good evening. I'll just briefly go over the procedure to be used for appeals. This is a procedure that we have used in the past for appeals of decisions that come to the council. We've also, uh, I'll just note, shared this appeal procedure with the appellant. So the vice mayor introduced the item. I'm now describing the framework. After I, uh, the council can ask me questions about the framework after I finish this presentation. After that, Chief Daly will, present, will be presenting the staff presentation. Council will then ask any questions to Chief Daly. The vice mayor will then open the public hearing and invite the appellant to make their presentation. The appellant will make their presentation. The council may ask questions of the appellant and the appellant may respond. And then the vice mayor will invite the public to speak. Um, applicants may speak during their allotted, uh, the applicants um, may speak during their allotted time, but not during public comment. Public comment is limited to three minutes per speaker or any other amount determined by the vice mayor. Um, there will then be uh, public comments from the public. The mayor or the vice mayor may ask staff to respond to any questions from the public. And the appellant may then have an opportunity to respond and the council may ask questions of the appellant after that. And then the vice mayor will close the public hearing and turn the, return the item to the council for deliberation and action. Are there any questions for me? All right. Council, have any questions? Am I on? No. Thank you. Questions? Questions about process? No? Okay. All right. So we will go now to the staff presentation. And I believe that's Chief Daly. All right. Good evening, Vice Mayor and Council Members. I'm here this evening to uh, go over the Capitola Bar and Grill Entertainment Permit Appeal. Next slide. <clears throat> so, quick overview. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about the city's entertainment permit requirements. We'll discuss the Capitola Bar and Grill application. Uh, we'll talk about the reasons that we denied that application, uh, and then the appeal process. Um, I know you've you've all had the information in your packet, so just a quick highlight of what uh, this code does. So Chapter 5.24 <clears throat> essentially governs uh, entertainment permits, and it, it identifies three categories. There's a single use, a minor entertainment, and then a general entertainment permit. Each one kind of goes higher. Uh, <clears throat> it also authorizes the city manager or the department head to issue those permits and to set the conditions to assure the entertainment does not cause uh, disturbances. Um, it authorizes the city council or the city manager to add conditions, including the date and time of operation and, those, and the levels to, to further manage those noise limits. Next. <clears throat> so the application itself, uh, the, the section 5.24080 uh, authorizes the city manager to create this applications. Um, part of that is that they uh, may be required to submit non-privileged information um, reasonably related to the ordinance itself. Um, our current application uh, does uh, require the information about the business, the proposed entertainment that's going to be on the, at the business, the hours of intended operation. Uh, we do uh, request the proper licensing, so if they have need an ABC license um, and, and also the fire inspections. And then we also require the property owner statement included um, with the property owner's signature. Uh, the current application that we've been using has been in place since 2018 and is consistent with all the neighboring jurisdictions. Next. So a little timeline as far as Capitola Bar and Grill. So Capitola Bar and Grill um, first received or applied for their uh, initial entertainment permit in October of uh, 2021. It was a, a minor entertainment permit uh, it was it was issued and valid for about six 
a little bit more than six weeks. Um, it expired on December of 2021. Uh, they immediately applied for, um, the, the permits are annual, annually issued. So they immediately applied for a, a minor entertainment per permit <clears throat> again for the next year. Uh, based on the application, we did request that the permit be upgraded to a general entertainment permit, which is live music. <clears throat> the permit was issued um, in the summer of that of 2022. We did start receiving complaints about the entertainment at Capitola Bar and Grill. Um, and then as we reviewed the, uh, the packet itself, we noticed that the owner's statement had not been completed and we did not have the signature. Uh, so they um, continued with the entertainment uh, at the end of, or basically at the end of uh, this last year, December 22, uh, they then applied for a general entertainment permit. Uh, we received the application. It did not have the property owner's signature. Next slide. Um, it, which is why that we didn't we uh, denied the permit being uh, incomplete. Um, this is a copy of the act or the, the language as far as the property owner's statement. Um, you, I know you have it all in your packet. Uh, next slide. Um, and then prior to um, issuing the final decision uh, that we did meet with um, Capitola Bar and Grill, um, we researched the history of the property owner consent. Um, all other permits do have that property owner's signature. Um, staff also um, looked at previous years and we, we looked at every year that we had, um, that we had retained and, and verified that information. Um, next slide. Um, again, as we kind of approach this, the end of 2022, we met with not only Capitola Bar and Grill, we I exchanged emails with both the landlord and Capitola Bar and Grill. We met with them in person. We also um, encouraged them to mediate um, both with the county and then we all also offered to sit down with everyone. Um, after the entertainment did continue into January 2023, we did um, issue our final notice of decision basically in denying that application. And then we received the, the appeal for this hearing on February 21st. Next. Um, as far as in their appeal packet, they kind of highlighted four, four areas. Um, so their first appeal point was that the city staff exceeded the authority to, to have these requirements. Uh, the Muni code clearly states that the city manager can develop this application. Uh, the code really is intended to protect um, not only the patrons, but the, the neighboring businesses in the residential areas. Um, part of the reasoning behind the, the property owner's consent is that because that they potentially can have multiple tenants, um, this particular building is that way. And then we want to make sure that everyone's kind of working together as a community. Uh, appeal point number two, uh, the city should not cancel that permit unless there's good reason. Uh, we did not cancel or revoke the entertainment permit. We continued it. The permits that we did issue, we allowed them to continue. Uh, we just denied this application because we did not have the property owner's consent on it. Next. Uh, the landlord is legally bound by this agreement and to allow uh, entertainment. Again, that's a civil, civil thing between the appellant and the landlord. Next. And because the city issued the permit twice in the past without the landlord's signature that we should reissue that, and uh, that's an error on our fat, on our, our end. We, we should have seen that signature and addressed it immediately. Um, it did not. Um, and so anyways, uh, the remedy for that would not be to grant another permit. So that's why we're here tonight. And then just in summary, so council does grant the city manager or department head to issue those entertainment permits and to develop the application. This application has been in place since 2018 and is consistent with all neighboring jurisdictions that do require that property owner's consent. Uh, the entertainment permits are issued by the police department. Um, there was an oversight by the PD staff when we in, in a, or improperly issued those permits in 21, 22. And Capitola Bar and Grill um, was denied because it was incomplete due to this um, property owner's consent. Next. And again, the recommendation is just to adopt a resolution denying that bill for the city manager's decision deny an application for the 2023 regular entertainment permit for Capital of Bar and Grill. And I'm open for questions. All right. Uh, council, have any questions of staff? Any questions? No questions? Okay. 
All right, uh, so we are going to open the public hearing and that will begin with a presentation from the appellant. Uh, you have up to eight minutes. Uh, feel free to come up to the dais. Do we have the mic turned on up there? Or not the dais, the podium? Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Michelle Strong from Capitola Bar and Grill. I got some legal things to say to start us off. As we said in our original appeal, if you decide to uphold the appeal and grant Capitola Bar and Grill an entertainment permit for 2023, there are at least two possible legal reasons for doing so. The ordinance does not require landlords consent signature. Therefore, the landlord's consent request on the form is optional, and the lack of it is not grounds for denial of the permit. And as city council, you hereby uphold the appeal, reverse the denial, and issue the entertainment permit for 2023. Even if the landlord's consent is required, as city council, you find a matter of fact and of law that the landlord less surrendered properties is bound by the lease contract it's signed, approving the CBG use of the property, which allows, includes, and still includes the right to live music. Therefore, the landlord's consent to the entertainment permit is deemed, given, and recognized even without the signature on the form. And as a city council, you hereby uphold the appeal, reverse the denial, and issue an entertainment permit for 2023. The history of the building is ironic in this situation. Our landlord, Steve Yates, was owner of Margaritaville for many years. That's known for live music, DJs, nighttime entertainment. When we came into the building, we our business plan says live music. I, I was transparent. I sent everything over to you guys with the lease, um, emails from the broker and the landlord. We were transparent. This has not been a successful spot in the last four years. We're the fourth owner, right? So we knew to fill that gap to get the locals back in is to bring live music in. So not only do I, I'm here for our business and fighting for the rights that to run the business the way we were told we could run it. I'm also speaking for my staff. During the winter time, that's when I have to cut back. I could do it and I could cut labor, but that hurts them. Between both of our businesses, we have 35 employees that live in Santa Cruz County. So that does affect all of us as a whole. Um, we are still currently in arbitration the emergency arbitration didn't feel that um, the music permit was an emergency situation, but they didn't say that it wasn't a valid argument. We're still currently in arbitration. Um, I know Steve Yates's reputation, and you know he blatantly said there's ramifications if you guys approve our permit, but he hasn't proven a loss. And we do have a loss. He could afford to kick us out of the apartment. We have an apartment and a commercial lease. He's evicting us from the apartment. He's saying he's taking it off the market. So if he can afford to lose our money because it's not good enough for him, he could afford to deal with his son upstairs, who we don't even know if there's a loss yet. Um, the most important thing about our music program was bringing in everybody. We do it during the day. We, are, we try to be respectful for our neighbors upstairs and across the hall. Um, we end by 7, 8 p.m. The blanket for the, anyone, the band down the street was practicing in their garage and they could have music, but we can't. So um, it was also, Keeping the visitors here so they could shop, spend money in the village, that's our goal. And we're asking again, please move forward to uphold our appeal, reverse the denial, and grant our 2023 entertainment permit.
So, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, my name is Sal and gen- Strong. I'm sorry, Mr. Strong. Um, I'll give you your your time in just a moment. Here, you have a couple more minutes. Um, I do have to ask. You know, in tradi- in Capitola, we have a long tradition of respecting everyone's point of view. And some might not feel as comfortable speaking if there's booing or cheering or clapping. And that's something that I am going to speak to later when we open the public comment. But there is a certain level of decorum that we need to maintain within the public meeting. So I do ask you to withhold any kind of cheering or clapping, at least until the very end of the item. Mr. Strong. (laughs) Mr. Strong, please continue. My apologies. Thank you. My name is LaSalle Strong. Uh, A lot of you know me out here. Um, I'm a loving person. I know I'm a big guy, but I have a big heart, too. Um, my main concern is, you know, I've been hearing things like you guys have been deemed to vote a certain way. And, and my thing is I want you guys to do it for yourself. You're not going to lose your job. You have a certain oath to uphold, and that's what no one can take from you. And I had a meeting not too long ago with the chief and the city manager, Jamie, and they basically said, don't waste your time. 500 bucks, don't come out here, you're gonna lose the appeal. I'm not gonna let somebody sway me. Let's do this, let's see, because I have heart. I have belief. I came to this city with belief. Steve Yates doesn't have nothing to lose because he's got power, he has money. I don't. My wife doesn't. All we have is our business. We have three businesses, and we fought for every one. And I'll tell you one thing that Steve does have. He has power to sit at the table and mediate with us and make a compromise. That's what this is all about. It's just music, guys. It's just music. Why are we getting evicted? He claims you have your paperwork. He doesn't know us. Why does he hate us so much? Why do we have to leave? This is what we're asking the city to help us. You know what's going on. You paint the picture. I don't need to say it. Let's not let this get that big. Let's not put the city of Capitola on the map for something like that. It's just ridiculous. Let's move past this. Issue us our permit. You did it already, and you admitted that you made a mistake. Come on, guys. Do what your heart says. This is music. Everybody loves music. We all come from something that reminds us something with music. Maybe it was a death. Maybe it was a wedding. Maybe it was something. But I can guarantee you that we have created a lot of memories since we've been here with music. Capitola will always be on the map, whether we're there or not. But you guys got to look past this. This is coming from something evil. And I challenge Steve Yates to sit at the table with me because I'm willing to compromise, whether it be days, hours, anything. He refuses. Why do you think he does that? Because he does not have anything to lose. We have our livelihood. So you guys think about that and think about your individual votes. You don't need someone telling you how to run your job. Let's make Capitola known for the first city to help a minority group. Let's not be the city that helped run the city out. Don't let Steve Yates weaponize you guys against us, please. Thank you, Mr. Strong. All right. Um, Thank you for your presentation. We will bring it back now to council for any questions of the appellant and appellant responses. So we'll start down here. Councilmember Clark, do you have any questions? I have none. Okay. Councilmember Brooks, questions? Councilmember Peterson, no questions. Okay. Um, Okay, so I'm going to invite members of the public to comment now. And before we uh, line up for that, um, the applicants have given their presentation and they will have um, some, some additional time later but public comment is not additional time to bring in the applicants. And it's also not a time for back and forth amongst the council member and the public. This is a time for us to hear from the public. So we won't be answering questions during the public comment period. 
Um, we thank you all for taking your time out this evening to come and participate in this public process. Uh, I, I do want to make a couple points as I had started earlier. We do have a tradition, as I mentioned, of respecting everyone's point of view and their right to express it at our council members. And so booing and cheering for those whose opinion we support, uh, support or oppose can become intimidating. And we want all who want to speak to feel free to speak. Uh, I also recognize that everyone in the room may not speak tonight, but want to support those who do speak. And so in order to maintain a uh, environment that fosters inclusion, we invite all of you, if you support something that is said at the, di at the podium, feel free to raise your hand when you hear it, and that will signal to us that you are in support of what's being said. Um, before we get started, can everyone in the room who wishes to speak tonight raise your hand? Oh yeah, how many do we have on Zoom? Four? Okay, all right. Um, given the number of speakers, we are going to have uh, two comments on, excuse me, two minutes for comments on this item in accordance with Capitola Municipal Code section 2.52050. Uh, I am asking our city clerk to help us stick to the time limit. So to do please limit your comments to the, to the two minutes. Uh, please be respectful of the clerk if she tells you that your time is over. Um, and with that, I will open the public comment for members of the public. Uh, please feel free to come up to the podium. You can form a line or come up as, as you feel comfortable to do so. Um, feel free to state your name if you'd like it in the record. What's that? Oh, yeah. Okay, yes, please state your name if you want it in the record. Um, and you will see a timer in front of you that'll let you know how much time you have. It'll flash yellow when you have a minute. Is that right, Julia? When you have 30 seconds, it'll flash yellow. It'll go red when your time is up. All right, welcome. Thank you, Vice Mayor, members of the council. I'm writing this letter in support of Capitola Bar and Grill. I'm a resident here in Capitola for four years now. I'm sorry. Now, I've recently taken a position bartending at CBG, Capitola Bar and Grill. I'm asking for your support to the music program at CBG. The music in the village is part of the culture of Capitola. I've been coming here for over 50 years with my children to vacation. And the reason we chose Capitola is because of this culture. It's one of the primary attractions for locals and for visitors. CBG is located right on the corner, and right on the beach of the, of the Esplanade. Music, dancing, good food, delicious drinks, all go together with the Esplanade and, and the other neighboring businesses that have music. This location, has always had music under different ownership. I don't understand why it's different now not to allow the music. And I understand all the previous comments and rationale for some mistakes that were made and so forth. Even more so now since the Wharf Houses closed as they were a popular place for music. Besides mu bringing music, fun, culture to Capitola at large, it brings revenue for the city. Music at Capitola Bar and Grill affects the livelihood of all the employees that work there. Supporting the music program at Capitola Bar and Grill will support the people Thank that you work for there. for your comments. That's been two minutes. The city's revenue and most of all the culture of the bit. We're going to have to ask you to step away. We do have other speakers in city. line. Please do the right thing and Thank allow you. the music. Thank you, sir. Hi, my name is Serena Wagner. I'm a local real estate agent, and I live here in the village. I'm also an employee at Capitola Bar and Grill. I'm also a single mother, and with real estate being difficult this year and all the difficulties we've had and coming out of pandemic, a lot of us need music more than ever. And we need the ability to create income in our town. I expect, as a village resident, to hear music. I hear it every night, all the time. 
So for anyone to complain about loud music, I think that's what you know happens here. And we move here because of that. It was a dream come true of me at mine to move here. And um, I just want to also, from a real estate perspective, I don't understand how they have the legal use as a commercial property, how you how someone could get involved in that legal use. I think that you have liability on your shoulder and I want you to not end up in a further lawsuit. And so I want you to approve this tonight. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alexis. My name is Alexis Underwood and I'm a teacher at Live Oak School District. And I've been coming, I lived in the village in the early 80s. And I've been coming to the village because of the music. I've been coming to the music, to the village, for the camaraderie of all the people, for all the, all the choices that we have of fun, of, um, of, I'm the I want to use. Um, of fun and and community, because I'm a community type of person, because I have children that I teach, and I've seen them grow up. They work in the village, and the music to me is important to bring life and people to the village, and um, please accept this. Thank you. Hi, my name is Donna Bunnell. I'm emotional right now. I grew up here all my life. I was one of the first employees at Polar Bear Ice Cream. I also was hired by Steve Yates when Margaritaville first opened. We came from Vail, Colorado. He was uh, owner of the Furriers of Vale. At any rate, and I used to do dinner parties with them. Bottom line is, my father taught me that music is the expression of joy. Music and dancing is the expression of joy. And ever since Capitola Bar and Grill opened up, I experienced that. And all my friends, and we all collaborated, and we all wanted to meet there. There was always early music. I'm 63 years old, turned 63 June 5th. And we embraced them because finally there was another establishment that had live music of all our favorite bands. And it was always early because I'm a senior now. So I enjoyed it immensely and getting together with all my friends and family and just dancing and listening to live music gave me such great joy. Plus, I live right up here in Capitola. And ever since they opened up Capitola Bar and Grill, I finally found a new establishment for early music and all my favorite bands. And then when that atmospheric, you know, river went through and destroyed all sandbar and everything else that had the live music, they collaborated with all the musicians and had them there for the days or whatever, you know, the Monday nights with Elvis Cicero, the Wednesdays with uh, Ted Welty, and just made the magic. And I'm just asking. Thank you. That's been two minutes. Okay. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, my name's Kelly Shannon. As I was walking up to this building, I noticed the diversity flag flying, and I had to wonder if it was understood what the stripes represented, especially the brown and black ones. I live near, the, near downtown Santa Cruz area. Um, but over a year ago, I started coming over to Capitola because my friends told me what a fantastic new place there was. I had often told um, family and friends that I didn't need to drive the 20 to 30 minutes that four miles across town to come to Capitola um, because there was so much to do on my end of town. But I started coming um, to um, the Sal and Michelle's place 
um, every week after I first after my first visit, I said it was my new favorite place. The amazing people there, um, the community, the music, the the musicians are all people who are from our community, your community. Um, what was I going to say here? Um, there, like I said, there's much closer places, but for me, Capitola Bar and Grill um, impressed me right away. Um, the quality drinks, the quality food, the amazing music, um, and, and what was most appealing to me, I guess, is, as somebody else said, it started early and ended early. I'm old. I got to get home in bed by 9 o'clock. <laughs> Anyhow, it's a wonderful place. And back to that flag flying over the building, I must ask if there's a reason LaSalle and Michelle are having to deal with the animosity other than the music issue. How come it wasn't that to begin with? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Council. My name is James Navarro. I'm currently licensed by the state of California as a general building contractor, and I'm presently restoring homes in your community. Uh, that were affected by the storm damage. But uh, not only am I familiar just because I'm in the area, for 40 years I've been coming over the hill. I live in the area of Willow Land of San Jose. I've always loved uh, Capitola. I've been coming for the last 40, been licensed for the last 20. My employees and I will frequent there. The food is delicious. Uh, the staff is excellent. The owners, I've spoken to them just on a basis of them coming in, saying hello. Uh, they treat everybody with a sense of community. Uh, what I'd like to speak with it for them today is because I've came all, all the way over the hill because I think it's important. This place uh, has entertainment that's very controlled. Like all of us and all of you, we're all pretty much mature ages, right? So I'm saying that's what goes there. Um, I've never seen a problem. I've always felt comfortable. The music, the live band has just presented an atmosphere that's fun. And it's controlled and people act like adults and they leave when they're supposed to. I've always left 32. I've actually danced there. So it's a nice place. But uh, I just wanted to say, I think if you could just keep a focus on what it's doing for the community, how it's helped other people, how it brings people of different cultures together, and we're able to share, have a great time with the music. I guess we have a little bit of drinking going too, like all of us do in this room. Uh, but other than that, I just wanted to say, I think it's a positive place. Keep it alive in the community. Please keep the music going. Thank you. Good evening, I'm uh, James Fredrickson. Um, you know, COVID, COVID shut this place down, and I'm sure there was a lot of revenue lost. There was a lot of lives that were irreparably altered. Uh, we barely came back from COVID, and then we had the storms to deal with. The entire Esplanade was shut down. Thankfully, the bar and grill survived the storms. They were able to open up you know, it, not long after the storms, but we saw the effect of the storms, how the people were affected, and why were they affected so greatly by the storms along the Esplanade? It's because of the music, the music venues. There are already too few mu music venues in the whole Bay Area. More bands than there are venues. More people that want to see those bands. Everybody comes here because of the music. They can go to restaurants anywhere, but the music is what brings people to Capitola. Everybody else, I mean, I have to say, I am very proud of my friend LaSalle because he has not once through this whole process mentioned race or tried to play a race card, but the bar and grill is being treated with prejudice. Other venues in the same city blocks have live music, and he doesn't, and we're all affected by that. Your constituents are affected by that. The city council doesn't want to get into a dispute between a landlord and the tenant, but by your actions, you have inserted yourselves into that process. The form that is filled out to get the permit is an arbitrary form that has been put together by you. And the line that where the owner has to sign is also arbitrary. I say take, it, take that out, away. Thank you for your comments. It's been two minutes. You know how to finish it. Don't get we in between them. We ask that you step aside so the next speaker can speak. Thank you. Okay, so I'm, my name is Patricia Timberg. I'm a teacher, 
high school, whatever. Anyway, um, I'm not going to say anything about how much we need the music here in Capitola and how much it means to everybody. You've heard it already. I am really upset, and I'll tell you why. These people have a business, and there has been music in that spot practically forever, and they are being denied the opportunity to keep their business open, and they are receiving eviction notices every single week. And I know Sal and Michelle have made every effort to try to talk to you guys and to the owner who will not talk to them. What is that all about? What kind of city is this? And if you want to go down in history as being the first group of people to deny a minority couple business the opportunity to be here, then you are breaking your oath like so many other public officials we know these days do. You're no better. And th this you need to change and you need to fix. Thank you. My name is Crazy George, professional cheerleader. I go by George Henderson. I lived there for over 50 years. I did a game last weekend, so I'm a little hoarse for the San Jose earthquakes, but I want to tell you something. What you're looking at is a man, Sal, and his wife, and they are great business people. They have 35 people working for them that need a job, and you're going against them for a guy that probably has millions of dollars, and you're siding with him, and he won't work with anybody. Sal will work with you. He wants to do everything he can to put a great show on. He's a great rust. rust restaurant here he knows entertainment and he knows how to get along with this city he's great and you have to reverse this stupid rule you just came up with to get rid of 35 people if he falls to side with somebody that won't work with you or him thank you thank you Uh, my name is Glenn Bransford. I'm a local, grew up here with uh, my family, both played music in Santa Cruz, and, and uh, we love all the events in Capitola. Been here, my great grandfather lived here, and um, just want to uh, support the, the live music that we have here and the, the culture that we've grown to know and love here in Capitola. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Don Williams. Not only am I a professor up at UCSC, but also been working at Cabrillo College for the last 15, 20 years exact. 36 years resident in the Santa Cruz area, and I keep my ear to the ground. I put a lot of folks in office because of the amount of students that I know. I'm also the first president of the local NAACP, and I have a, I have a son, I call it a son, who runs the national chapter nationwide, a view chapter in WCP, where at any time I call him up, he comes. And he comes all the time. What I'm trying to say is simply this. We have a time when we can change and do things right. Diversity is at its all-time highest, and we need to learn how to embrace each one another. We all know that Capitola has a history of not treating people right. I got history of knowing that, of people who've been arrested, who've been accosted by, by officials that run this city. Some folks are scared to even come here, and that needs to change. This is the only black operation that I've known since I've been living here. I can count five establishments in Santa Cruz that were black, owned. Can we do better? Can we change the polarity of how we do in this city. I know we can. I believe in you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dwayne Garner, and I used to live in Capitola at uh, Plum Street in the apartments. 
back when there was a liquor store on the corner. Um, I live on the west side of Santa Cruz now, and I played softball with Hurry Back In, John Nevin. I played flag football with Capitola police officers. And I just want the council to try to come up with some kind of compromise in this situation so we can keep this going. Um, I don't know what that would be. I don't know what it is, but I'm sure there's something that we can do to make this make this work. We, we all know what's happening, and I don't need to go into detail about that, but can you do a temporary permit with some restrictions on it? Um, you know, just try, think of something. Try to do something. There's got to be something. Thank you. Hi, my name's Chick Goodman. Uh, I've been uh, listening to music in that building since 1972. Uh, that was Capitola Joe's back then, had the only live music in town except for Max Patio and Jimmy Del Piero had a piano bar. Uh, to say that music doesn't belong in that building is absurd. Other people in the, in the building, Mr. Toots is playing music right now. The ordinance does not require the signature of the, of the landlord. So, I mean, wh what are we doing here? Why are you not allowing music? Somebody mentioned earlier, for us old farts, you, we, we get music from 5.30 to 8.30. That's a time when we come to town. When we come to town, we go out, maybe get a slice of pizza, pizza by heart, maybe go to the sandbar, buy something else. You're bringing people from all around for the music. Now, that's especially important in the winter. In the summer, sure, every place is full. It's a summer resort. But in the winter, when they have that early music, people come to town. When they're in town, they spend money. So your vote today helps all of your businesses down there. It's an entertainment district. That one place would not be allowed to have entertainment when virtually every other place on that street has entertainment now. That just doesn't make sense. And that's kind of what, what I think. I look around, I go, something doesn't make sense here. Something is wrong here. Something is really wrong here. If some rich guy who lives in Hawaii, who's an absentee owner, who doesn't show up for the arbitration hearings, and he's the one... I mean, what's that old Rolling Stones, under my thumb? Are you guys under his thumb, or are you voting for the people of Capitola? Pick one. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nancy Williams, and I've been in this community for over 30 years, and I stand with and in support of Capitola Bar and Grill. And I stand with that saying that, like my husband said, this is, a minority-owned business that people like me don't have a lot of places to go to feel comfortable or a sense of belonging and inclusion. And in that space, I find that, and I think that is crucial and important to include people of diversity. I also want to say that it's mentioned that the ordinance does not need the landlord's signature. So that should be taken into account since you're looking at legality. If that does, isn't required, then that's something to consider as a priority. Also, they've had it for two years without his signature, so you already set precedent. And it seems as if bringing that up now is just some excuse to fit into some other person's narrative. And so I ask that you reconsider that because we stand in support and we stand with Capitola Bar and Grill. Thank you. Hi, my name's Dawn Campbell. I don't do public speaking. But there was a point in your presentation where you kind of glossed over the fact that um, there's a history of no landlord signing the application. So I find it very ironic that Sal and Michelle are being singled out when everyone else is having live music. And I know there's probably a few establishments that go about having live music without even applying for a permit. So once again, it's, it's mind boggling to me that you've denied them their right and there's not one person that's come up to stand here to say they don't want them to have music. So I hope you'll consider reversing your decision because it makes no sense. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment in person? Okay. 
We will go now to public comment on Zoom. We don't currently have any members of the public on Zoom who have their hands raised. We have attendees. If there's anyone who would like to speak, please raise your hand and we can unmute you. We'll give it like 10 seconds. Any takers? Nope, no takers. So in that case, we have no further speakers. All right, um, with that, I will close the public comment section and, and bring it back to the council and staff. I'll start with staff, if there's any staff responses to any questions or comments uh, as appropriate. Seeing none. I think, I think there's just one point that deserves clarification. Good. And it may have just been something that Chief Daly went over relatively quickly. What staff did when this item got elevated to management, the first question the chief asked and I asked was, have we done this before? Have we let people do entertainment since, night, since 2018 when we had this, this new application without the landlord's signature? Police department did a deep dive, pulled up every single file that we had, and the answer is no. We interviewed all of our staff who've overseen this program. They recounted two stories of literally going around, running around the village, trying to get the landlords to sign, trying to get the folks to get the landlords to sign these applications. So this isn't a situation where this is a standard that wasn't being enforced previously. It's always been enforced. Every other application had it. We had a transition in our staff team during the pandemic, and unfortunately, it was missed. It was a mistake on staff's part. Um, I certainly regretful mistake. Apologize to the council that we made that. But I want everyone to be clear that this isn't singling out one particular owner. Every other entertainment permit was signed by the property owner, authorized by the property owner. So I just wanted to make that point clear because I think it wasn't 100% clear and I heard some different testimony this evening. But otherwise, I don't think we have anything else to add and I'm available for questions. Several speakers raised issues that they care, including the, strong, the uh, Strongs, raised issues that they characterized as legal issues. If the council has any questions for me about those, I'm happy to respond. Thank you. Um, any additional questions or comments from uh, council at this point? No additional questions or comments? Okay. In that case, it goes back to the appellants. Uh, if you have any additional comments or a rebuttal for anything that was said, you have up to four minutes. Hey, back again. Uh, I would like to first rebuttal what city manager said, and he made a comment that he ran around to all the owners to get the signature. He was pushing that. They haven't done it for us. So where is that running around when it comes to us? Also, I'd like to add that Mr. Yates, he isn't here. He doesn't care. He doesn't care about the city. He doesn't even live here. But he's weaponized you guys for sure. And I think you guys should think really hard about that. Um, I want to thank everybody here tonight as well, everybody that spoke. Um, you guys, I know this has been really our struggle doesn't end today. Like I said, we are on the brim every day of getting eviction notices for the most recent one this week is my satellite. My security cameras are in violation of my lease, so he wants to evict me for that. This right here is a stack. <laughs> and these are one, one two pages. This is a stack of eviction notices that I get once per week. Um, the story always changes. My issue is we pay over $200,000 a year towards that building. Commercial lease, a residential lease. We pay the property taxes portion, maintenance on the building. Um, so it is alarming that somebody that we give that to for his property has never wanted to meet us, never wanted to compromise with us. We're here today to ask you, you do have the ability to make a compromise, to make something that ends seven, eight, um, 
The natural noise ordinance blanket across the county, I believe, is 10 p.m. for everybody. So technically, the neighbor next door can have a band in his house till 10 p.m. So we're just asking for the same kind of compromise to be able to do those things once or twice a week, whatever the compromise ends. My fear is that if this landlord, this tenant, start setting the precedence of we can complain before 10 p.m., a lot of the other neighbors and the other businesses and the landlords are going to start fighting amongst each other now because now we're going before 10. So now that opens up the door for the neighbors of Cork and Fork to start complaining to their landlord. So we're asking for something, a compromise before 10. And I didn't want to forget, but uh, Vice Mayor, if you could explain as well um, what vote we're looking for. We don't do this every day. So um, everyone keeps asking me, do we want a nay or a yay? And I said, I don't really know. So um, again, I appreciate everybody here. It's, it's something our livelihood is at stake. Uh, not just for the music. This is more than music. He wants us out of the building. And every day we're fighting. Um, and I'm tired, you know. Uh, I just want to run my businesses. That's all I want. This is a dream. This is our dream coming true. And somebody doesn't even want to acknowledge us. Steve Yates and his son have once said in all the comments that we are not a good fit here. Well, I'm here to stay. You know, I, I am. And now I'm interested. Now I want to make change. I want to run for mayor. Thank you. Can I hold no, my student. Thank you. All right. Um, where are we? Any additional uh, questions of the appellants before we return? Questions? Questions? Okay. All right, at that, this point, I will close the public hearing and return this item to staff and council for additional uh, discussion, deliberation, and action. Is there any additional comments from staff before this goes to council? Okay. All right, uh, bringing it back to council. I started at that end last time. I'm going to start at this end this time. Councilmember Peterson, do you have any comments that you would like to make as we deliberate? I can come back to you, too, if you want. Okay. Deliberation. Um, you can make an action if you want for the sake, for the sake of discussion. And um, let me just, actually let me just clarify real quick because I do want to clarify. It was asked the question of what what vote are we looking for will depend on what the motion is. So we don't know if some we don't know what the motion is going to be made for the action, and then there will be votes amongst the council members of yes or no on whatever that motion happens to be. And I'll explain what it what it means once it happens. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I've always been really transparent and honest with the two of you. So my comments today are status quo and the conversations we've had. So although there was staff oversight in the early stages, it is clear to me that it was a mistake, as mentioned by our Chief Daly, made during a worldwide pandemic, which is unfortunate, and I'm sorry for that. However, I believe that both parties need to find a resolution amongst themselves through the arbitration process through the court system. And I really hope a resolution is found soon where both parties can find compromise as stated by Mr. Strong. And I work and I would encourage Mr. Yates to do so without prejudice as stated by many this evening and with all the speakers. If through the arbitration process an agreement is made in favor of the Strongs, I would encourage them to resubmit the application process in which I would approve. However, in the meantime, I would like to make a motion to move staff recommendation denying an appeal of the city manager's decision to deny an application for a 23 regular entertainment permit for Capitola Bar and Grill. I could also just comment on that before. I would like to give it a second. Um, it is really unfortunate that we're here, and uh, I would really like to see the business owner and the property owner come together so they can get to a resolution. But I would just second the motion at this time. Um, I just have a couple comments, and then uh, I'll explain if there's any additional explanation about the motion. Um, I 
sympathize with the challenges that you've experienced with your landlord. And I surely do hope that there is a resolution in which he signs the permit and you're able to come back and get live music. In fact, if he signs the permit, you won't be back in front of us. It'll be approved by staff, correct? Yeah. Um, and I hope he does. I'm a fourth generation musician, live music, played in venues throughout the county. And I know the benefits of performance arts and music and live entertainment and its power for healing and community building as many of you have spoken to today. I don't dispute that. Uh, I see your belief and your heart for your business. And if that is all I was asked to consider is whether you have the heart, whether entertainment is beneficial, whether music is beneficial, this would be a no brainer. Um, you may have, some of you may have been here earlier when we were talking about our fee schedules and we were talking about uh, bands on the bandstand. And there's many bands, entertainers and musicians that can bring joy and create community on that bandstand. But as you heard, we're not waiving fees for the bandstand because of the benefits that the music on it can bring. We want to see the benefit in our community and we also need a certain level of regulation to ensure consistency, respect for neighbors and continuity of regulation for everyone in the village and in the business community. I don't see this appeal as an issue of whether you deserve to have live music in your establishment, but rather as a council member, my role is to determine if city requirements for a permit were met, and in this case, they were not, by no fault of your own, to be quite, quite honest. Uh, I encourage you to um, reach out to the Conflict Resolution Center of Santa Cruz County if they are able to be of service. I wish you only the best in the legal challenge. Um, the motion that was made was to deny the appeal, deny the appeal, correct? I'm not, I, wanna, I wanna make sure I'm saying this right. It's to adopt the resolution. To adopt the resolution, which will deny the appeal, which means if the council, every council, if three of the four of the council members vote yes, that means your appeal is denied and your entertainment permit will not be issued. If three of the four council members vote no, then you're back and to we're consider back to what's discussion. next. Yes. Okay. We have a motion and we have a second. Let's do a roll call vote. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Clark. Aye. Councilmember Peterson. Aye. And Vice Mayor Brown. Aye. Okay, so motion carries. We wish you the best in the legal challenges ahead. And we hope to see you back. Yay. Thank you. Yay. 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 All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, we'll have order, please. Ma'am, you had written it before we even got here. I was writing during public comment. You are correct. Thank you for coming this evening. All right. Well, that brings us to item eight, which is adjournment. This meeting is adjourned.